Okay, Councillor Mrs Jones, we are now streaming live. I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I really apologise, particularly to members of the public that are trying to log in for the delay, but it's been a technical hiccup and uh, it happens. So, good afternoon. I'm the Chair of the Planning Application Committee and for the benefit of members of the public, I would make necessary introductions and would appreciate it if each person would show their hands as I mention you. Mr Coates, Dave Coates is Head of Planning, Development and Environment. Lisa Hutchinson is our Planning, Principal Planning Officer. Mr Andrew Harrington is the Council's Planning Governance Lawyer. Mr Paul Dalton is the Democratic Services Officer and Paul's role is to minute the meetings and vote counts and so forth and take care of our administration. Will all the elected members please show your hands. These elected members make the decision and they will be voting on each application. However, as the Planning Committee Chair, my role as the Chair is to maintain order at the meeting and ensure that the meeting proceeds in accordance with Council's planning protocol. In the event of a vote being tied, as the Chair, I will have the casting vote. Thank you, everybody. Over to you, Paul. Do we have any vacancies and do you want to do a roll call of attendance? Yes, no problem, Chair. Uh, I've received no apologies for the meeting, but just for the benefit of members of the public, if I can just do a roll call of attendance, as we normally do members, if I'll read your name out in alph alphabetical order, and if you can just indicate verbally that you are in attendance at the meeting. Um, Councillor Allen. Present. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Present. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cousins. Present. Uh, Councillor Heslop. Present. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Johnson. <laughs> Present. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Mrs Jones. Present. Uh, Councillor Kia. Present. Uh, Councillor Lee. Here. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Lister. Present. Thank you. Councillor Marshall. I'm here, Paul. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McCollum. Present. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Tate. Afternoon, Paul. Good afternoon, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Tosterman. I'm here. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Wallace. Present. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, that's everybody in attendance, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. And I take no declarations of interest. Yeah. Can we now approve the minutes of the meeting that was held on the 23rd of December? Do I have approval and a seconder for those, please? Can we move, move them? I'll move. And seconded anybody? Seconded, seconded, Chair. Thank you very much for that. Can I now go to Mr Andrew Errington, who will introduce proceedings. Uh, should, we, this... should we agree those minutes, Chair? We've oh, moved and seconded them. I assumed, I apologise. Oh, forgive me, no, no. <laughs> yeah, are they agreed by everybody? Anybody, any comments on them? All OK, thank you very much. And thank you for that, Councillor Wallace. She was agreeing the minutes, I assume, Councillor Cousins, were you? Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor Cousins. Um, can I take you now to Andrew Errington, the Assistant Director of Law and Governance, who will introduce the proceedings for the meeting. Mr Errington, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, for each matter, we begin with the Planning Officer introducing the uh, application. And in doing so, uh, they will draw members' attention to any further representations which have been received from supporters or objectors subsequent to those referred to in the report. Following that, any ward councillor present who wishes to speak may do so. Members may then ask questions of the applicant or agent if they are present. Just to point out, this is an opportunity for members to seek clarification on facts. It's not an opportunity for the agent to make a presentation. The planning officer will then summarise the key planning issues. Members may ask officers questions, and then the planning officer will be invited to make any final comments. Members will then debate the application and formulate motion or motions on which to vote and take vote or votes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Arrington. Just to reiterate again what Mr. Arrington says before we go actually into the planning applications, that representatives here for the applications other than ward councillors may not make any 
uh, statement. You're here to answer questions that members may ask you. Thank you very much. Item 5A, which is Bank Top, LaSalle's. Are you taking that one, Lisa? Thank you. I am chair, yes, thank you. Could we have the presentation, please, Michael? So just while we're waiting for that to load, it's it's page 15 on, on, on your agenda. Um, KNS Peacock at 55 Nisham Road, um, change of use from off licence to a hot food takeaway with uh, the installation of an external flue on the, on, on the north elevation of the property. I'll just wait for the presentation to load and then we can uh, talk through the slides. Thank you, Michael. So this this first slide just shows the general location of the of the site in the context of the uh, the, the town. So it's uh, to the east side of uh, Nation Road at its junction with 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 Brunton Street. And if we can move on to the next slide. So this just shows it in, in, in more detail. It's an end of terrace property, ground floor, last use is off license and the first floor um, is a residential flat. Um, Nisha Road, as you can see, runs to the, uh, to, to the west side, um, Brunton Street to the north and then um, residential streets off there. It's a predominantly residential area. So, um, so as I explained, it's proposed to use the ground floor as a hot food takeaway with a, a flue on the side elevation. The first floor flat will be retained and other than the, the, the flue, there'll be no other external alterations. Um, opening hours would be restricted by condition to um, between 11 o'clock in the morning and, and 9 p.m. at night, Monday to Sunday, and that includes bank holidays as well. And if we can just move through, please, Michael. So this is a, an aerial shot and this shows the extent of the, uh, the, the consultation, the blue squares, the, uh, where, where the letters have been sent, notification letters are sent to, four objections received, which I'll run through shortly. Um, and if we can just move on. Yep, so these are the existing and proposed floor plans, just to confirm no, no real changes there. Um, the next slide will show the flue in the um, north elevation, which will front on to, to Brunton Street. So the slides top and bottom right um, show a fairly modest flue um, projecting through the side elevation and terminating sort of midway between the, the eaves and the, and the ridge of the, of the property. Thank you. Um, I will just have a quick look at the photographs. And then I'll run you through the uh, the consultation responses and the issues. So this is the property on the corner here, um, corner of Brunton Street and uh, and and, and Nisham Road. So um, former off license at the ground floor, um, residential prop flat above, and surrounded by residential properties to to, to the side, and, and obviously on Brunton Street as well. So in terms of um, consultation responses, these are set out on page 17 of the and 18 of the of the report, and I'll just quickly run through those, Chair, if, if I may. Um, so no objection in principle from the Council's Highway Engineer or Environmental Health Officer, subject to a number of conditions from the Environmental Health Officer, which I'll, I'll run through in due course. Um, no objection from the Architectural Liaison Officer. Um, in, in terms of any issues of antisocial behaviour um, and Darlington Association on Disability um, advise that the provision of a temporary access ramp on the front um, is acceptable as a minimum form of provision for disabled access and I'll run through that at the appropriate stage in, in, the, in the presentation. Um, a total of four letters of objection have been received and I'll just run through the main points. Um, these points relate to the town being overrun with takeaway shops, um, another place selling unhealthy food, the visual approach into Darlington Town Centre is becoming an eyesore with takeaway shops, um, concerns about traffic, noise um, and smell from the takeaway, potential for an increase in litter, um, a large number of fast food businesses nearby and as a result um, competition with, with, with other similar businesses as well. Um, so that's the um, that, that, that's the, the consultation publicity. We've had no further comments either. So in terms of, of main issues, um, start first with, with visual amenity. As you can see from the photograph, the um, bottom photograph probably shows the position of the flue best, that that would um, project up the side, the gable end and, and terminate just above the eaves height. So in, in visual amenity terms, um, although it would be visible, it's not an, an unduly prominent feature. Um, so that doesn't give rise to any particular concerns regarding visual amenity. So the main issue really relates to, to, to residential amenity. Um, and, and clearly the main issues surrounding hot food takeaways relate to the impact on residential amenity in terms of noise from the comings and goings of, of customers and, and the vehicles, fumes, um, smell um, and, and potential antisocial behaviour. 
And as we've seen, um, the, the surrounding area is predominantly residential in character with the first floor property above and living conditions could be adversely affected if, 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 if appropriate put in place. Obviously, you'll note that uh, the property was last used as, a, as an off-licence um, in terms of activities, comings and goings, etc. Vehicles, um, activities are not too dissimilar with that, that previous use. Um, and the shop didn't have any control over hours of opening. So arguably, activities um, could continue later into the evening than, than is currently being proposed as part of this proposal, um, which, which would, would close at nine o'clock on an evening. Um, and those opening hours are consistent with other hot food takeaways elsewhere in the town, particularly those close to, to, to residential areas. Um, the environmental health officer has no objection to the to the proposal subject to a number of conditions and they're set out in the recommendation. They're three to eight and they relate to such matters as um, the extraction system, hours of opening, which would be nine o'clock on 11 a.m. until 9 p.m. on an evening, um, controlling delivery hours um, and the storage of waste. Um, similarly, the highway engineer has no um, highway objection. Um, again, there would be a certain amount of, of highway activity, par access parking associated with the retail use. Um, and takeaways typically operate within a, a higher turnover of short duration parking and, and, and quite a high number of, of, of pass by trips as well. Or equally people visiting on foot from the surrounding residential areas. Um, and on that basis, uh, there'd be little change to the vehicular activity over and above that associated with the former retail use. So that, that doesn't give rise to any issues of, 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 of highway safety in terms of access or parking. Um, I mentioned before about um, Darlington Association on Disability and the, the issue of the ramp at the front. Um, you'll notice the, the, the shop front has quite an unusual arrangement. The access door is sort of splayed on the corner um, and it's the, the applicant has um, explained that it's not feasible to um, provide a, a permanent access ramp without significantly remodelling the front of the shop, which is not currently in a position to do. So as an alternative, um, a temporary ramp is proposed, which would be available for people to use on request um, and assistance provided. Um, and it will be removed after it's been used to avoid trip, a trip hazard into, into the highway. So um, Darlington Association on Disability have confirmed that they are um, satisfied with that as a as a minimum provision for disabled access, and likewise, the highway engineer has also confirmed that providing the ramps moved once it's once it's no longer required um, on that particular occasion that um, it doesn't pose a, a, a trip hazard. Um, if we just turn to page um, twenty one, um, the the other matters um, relating to the application. Um, just in terms of the, the, the comments we've received by objection, competition's been raised and, and that's, members will be aware, isn't a competition between businesses, isn't a material planning consideration. But the other issues that have been raised relate to the number of takeaways and the sale of unhealthy food um, and, and, you know, with, with some links to, to, to obesity. Um, now, while that's capable of being a material planning consideration, the weight that can be attached to that um, really depends on there being a, an evidence base um, backed up by um, a planning policy which we don't currently have um, and there's not an, there's not a, a, such a policy either in the emerging local plan either so um, as I said while weight can be attached to that we don't have an evidence-based policy which would allow us to um, consider the such impacts um, as, as part of this application so what as, I, as, as the report does explain the report's been the, the application has been assessed in terms of its impact on on residential amenity, visual amenity, highway safety, etc. So the recommendation chair, um, as set out on um, pages 22 and 23 of the report, is, is is to grant planning permission, subject to a number of conditions. And as I mentioned before, the majority of those conditions are. Um, conditions to ensure that the amenities of surrounding residential properties are, are protected. So it's the it's number two, which is the closing to the opening hours, 11 a.m. till 9 p.m. Um, conditions three and four relating to, um, and, and five indeed, relating to the extraction system. Um, condition six also relating to the extraction system as well. Um, condition seven regarding the storage of um, refuse storage facilities. Eight relates to um, delivery um, times um, and nine and ten obviously relate to um, the provision of the ramp being available at all times. Um, so thank you chair. 
Thank you very much, Lisa. I believe the two ward councillors have indicated that they wish to speak on this. Can I have confirmation, please, of anybody that wishes to speak from the ward councillors? Councillor Newell, ward councillor. Can I be heard? Councillor Newell. Can, am I, can you hear me? Yes, you're oh, in. Right. OK, thank you. No um, problem. Yeah, Councillor Crumbie and I um, do have some comments to make in support of some of the issues that have been raised by the objectors. objectors. Um, firstly, in regard to the number of takeaways and hot food outlets that are already in the area. So from around the corner, around St John's Church in Yarm Road, up Nisham Road to the Copper Beach, there must be in excess of 10. We wonder about the need for a further takeaway in view of the proximity of the others, particularly those in Yarm Road. And we appreciate that there's no policy over the proliferation of takeaways, but we are told that Bank Top and Versailles has the fourth highest number of takeaways in the borough. As there are only one or two in the LaSalle's part of the ward, it can only be assumed that the rest are concentrated in the bank top area. In addition, um, I appreciate uh, what's been said with regard to um, health issues, but we would challenge in paragraph 36 of the report that there is insufficient evidence about obesity being a significant issue in this part of the borough. The residents in Bank Top and Lascelles have the worst health outcomes and life expectancy rates in the town. And linked to this is the issue of obesity. Surely yet another takeaway would do nothing to improve these problems. The authority launched the Childhood weight measure, Healthy Weight Measurement Plan in which it was noted that there was an increase in the consumption of takeaways contributing to levels of obesity. According to um, this plan, Bank Top and LaSalle has the highest proportion of obese five-year-olds and 40% of six year six students are obese together with the highest proportion of obese adults. So we do consider that the health issue is a significant. Um, John, I'm in. OK, I've just got some feedback. Shall I carry on? So we do consider that the health issues are significant in this area and should be taken into consideration. Um, with regard to the um, issues of traffic and parking, um, we've already dealt with parking issues in Brunton Street, some of which have been rather volatile. And we do have concerns about additional parking, albeit for a short period of time, and envisions that there will be problems. Also, there are problems uh, which uh, occur as a result of trying to exit from Brunton Street into Nation Road because of the high volume of traffic. We also have um, concerns about the temporary nature of the disabled access. With the best will in the world, it could often be overlooked to take it back in again after use uh, causing a trip hazard. So if this application is granted, we would ask that the proprietors undertake to keep the area litter free. We've had persistent problems in Brunton Street with rubbish and litter, but as a result of a litter initiative, there's been a significant improvement. So we hope the proprietors will work with the community here. Also, although approved by DAD and highways, we would hope that the ramp will be a temporary measure and will be replaced by a permanent fixture as soon as possible. In relation to environmental health uh, on page 24, we wonder if there'll be a check to see if the appropriate number of the wash basins are installed, as apparently it's unclear from the information contained in the application. Thank you, Chair. You're on mute, Councillor Mrs Jones. 
Sorry, Councillor Tate, I'm ticking you off for being on mute. Your turn. <laughs> Councillor Tate. Thank you, Chair. It's just a question for Lisa, if I may. Um, in regards to the traffic, I'm putting myself in a resident shoes here if I lived in Brunnerton Street. You mentioned that the vehicle traffic will be similar to the former retail use. Can you inform me how long that shop's been closed? Through you, Chair. Um, I, I couldn't, I'm afraid. Um, but I suppose from a, a planning point of view, you know, that could open at any point in time. Real yeah, I, I, appreci use. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, mm. But I think from my own knowledge, is I think it's close to five years. Right. It's, okay. a, it's quite a significant amount of time. So to say that the traffic will be similar to the former retail use, I, I don't really feel comfortable with that because if I was a recent resident in that street within that period there wouldn't be that traffic there because it's been closed. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone can find that answer. Right I don't know sorry chair I don't know whether Arthur could Arthur Housen could perhaps comment on that in terms of you know even if it has been closed I, I stress the point that it could yeah. reopen at any point in time over which we have no control okay. um so you know people could um you know park up and, and visit the shop and i accept that you know perhaps that's not happened for a number of years yeah. but in, in planning terms that is a a reasonable position that it could, could open again tomorrow um and there's activity levels associated with that over which we have no control um i'm not sure whether arthur might be able to um just to sort of explain yeah. a bit more about his, um, you know, the, the, the rationale behind that in terms okay. of comparable activity. Uh, yeah, certainly. So really, as Lisa's explained, I think we'd, we'd be looking at the position of what would be, would there be any impact above and beyond the, the extant um, permission that's in place for the retail shop, the, the corner shop. So we'd expect the sort of generation to be similar, but perhaps the, 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 the peak period of of trading would be after the the PM peak because we, when we look at traffic flows, they reduce vastly after about six or seven o'clock on Nisham Road. Um, accepted um, the comments that were made earlier about Nisham Road. Obviously, it is a, a busy road. It's a principal route uh, into town. But once the volume is going off the highway network um, into the evening peak, um, you know it's not really considered. A factor and again it will be that over and above demonstrating that over and above traffic generation um that's associated with that extant permission on the on the shop uh i'll take your point councillor tate that if you are a recent resident that will have not had any uh any particular vehicle uh movements associated with it but i think when we're looking at in terms of refusal for traffic we'd be looking at something that demonstrates a severe impact and that will be something that causes congestion or road safety issues so it will be difficult to evidence that really uh, to warrant refusal in my opinion thank, thank you, you. councillor marshall councillor marshall yeah thanks chair um I, I just like to mirror the ward councillor's concerns over the disabled access um, and, and, and having a temporary one. I'd just like to ask the question, is the fact that the new business are not currently in, in a position to finance the external alterations to put a permanent thing, a valid reason for for approving this um, this application? It says that in the minutes, I understand. Do you want me to repeat that? No, no, it's OK. I'm going to take all the questions and then as they seem to be to the applicants, I will bring the applicant in to just answer the questions, nothing more. Councillor Allen, I'll bring you in next, and then I'll bring the applicant in, Councillor Marshall and uh, Newell. Just search here, that was a question to the planning to the planning authority, not not, not to the applicant. On, um, on, on, on paragraph 30, it says that the applicant confirmed that with uh, with opening a new business, they, they may not, we're not currently in a position mm. to provide um, a permanent wrap because because of the financial situation the question to the planning people is is that a valid a valid position to take in 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 accepting in recommending acceptance of this of this application okay Th thanks chair okay alan lisa thank you chair um th th through you um Obviously, the ideal situation will be a permanent ramp that, that, that's there as a, um, a means for everybody to be able to access the, 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 the property, um, regardless of their, of their ability. Um, as I understand, um, 
the, the, the applicant was in a position was not in a position to be able to uh, to undertake the alterations to the premises. So this was um, a, a compromise, if you like, and that was done in close um, discussion with Darlington Association on Disability and Highways as well. Um, and and this compromise position was reached. Um, so whilst we'd always um, prefer a, a, a permanent solution, um, so that everybody's got fair and equal access to the property. Um, on, on balance, um, th this was considered to be a, an, an appropriate alternative with appropriate safeguards in place um, in terms of the conditions to, to make sure it's, it's it's there, it's available on request and not assistance is offered. Um, and that was, as I said, that was done in close discussion with uh, with, with the case officer, with the applicant and with um, with, with DAD as well as, as, as highways. OK, thank you. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I missed the presentation because my computer fell out again. Um, so could I ask, please, how many people uh, in the locale were actually um, sent letters and asked for their opinion on this particular uh, application, please? I think we'll bring Lisa to answer that, Lisa. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the presentation to go back through. Um, so you can, I'm not sure whether you can see that slide, Councillor Allen. It's um, an aerial shot. Yep. So there were 16 neighbours consulted, a site notice posted, um, and, and four objections received. Obviously, the nearest property being on, on Brunton Street with the red triangle. Another three were, were off, off shot, um, but 16 consulted. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Lee. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, a rather obvious question, perhaps perhaps a silly question in many ways, but when I look at the photograph, the entrance door doesn't seem that particularly wide to get a disabled chair in. Now, I, I appreciate the photographs taken from some distance, but it does seem rather narrow. And then what sort of space is there within the building to manoeuvre the wheelchair once you get through that door? I mean, with Gordon Pybus uh, looking at it, I don't doubt that the door He'll have considered that, but it does look a bit narrow and not having no dimensions. I'm just just throwing that into the, the melting pot. Lisa, are you happy that Dad have looked at that and that they're content with that? Just for Councillor Lee's question. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I mean, as I say, it has been um, subject of, of close discussions and continual discussions with, with, with DAD. So um, whilst the photograph you know, was was taken at eight o'clock this morning on the opposite side of Nation Road. It's maybe not, you know, fully reflective of um, of, of the dimensions of the door, and I'm I'm, I'm sure that that that, that would have looked at, been looked at in close detail. There is actually a a, a, photo, a, a plan shown there, um, but um, as you can see, there's a, there's a slight step up there which the the, the ramp would would seek to address. Um, there is a, a shutter in it in a shutter around the, the frame of the door as well, which maybe, um, you know, encloses it somewhat and makes mm. it look smaller than it is. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that that will have been looked at um, in close detail by, by Gordon Pybus and DAD. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wallace. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Newell and Councillor Crumby have raised really good points regarding uh, the unhealthy nature inevitably of, of most fast food uh, and the high concentration in this particular part of their ward and I think um, we've been told that there is no policy uh, on this matter although there could be and there isn't doesn't appear to be one that's forthcoming um, that really leaves I think the committee in a difficult position because it's a, a strong point that's been made one that maybe other planning authorities do take into account but we don't because there's an absence of policy, and I just wondered, you know, why there is this gap in the uh, uh, in the policy framework, and and what can you know? Clearly, it's out with the remit of this committee, but what you know, what is being done about it, or is it simply that the committee will continue to receive applications like this, and there's no policy to to guide us? It certainly makes me uncomfortable about supporting the uh, application. Yeah, I'm going to bring Mr. Courts in to answer that one, Dave. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Hello, members. Um, we we have looked at this in in some detail, Councillor Wallace, and, and the, the the question you you've you've posed is is a legitimate one. And it, it's it, it echoes what Councillor Newell has already said. Um, I, I'm, I'm, we're not seeking to say to members that um, health and obesity 
isn't a planning issue that we can take into account. Um, clearly, there, are, there is extensive planning law to suggest that, that that is in fact the case in certain circumstances. Um, we've done a little bit of research around other local authorities and, and how they actually tackle this. Um, and where there is a, a very clear policy hook um, where there's an identified problem which has resulted in a, a very specific policy. Um, the, the, the degree of success of appeals against refusals, um, as far as the councils are concerned, is, is quite high. So, um, but there has to be a, a policy hook to do it. And, and that leads on from an, an identified problem. Now, I, I'm fully aware that um, in this particular ward, um, there is obesity issues. Um, I'm also aware in this particular ward, uh, in relative terms, uh, COVID illness and, and death has, has been higher than most, if not the highest within the borough. Um, but one of the things I'm, I'm a little concerned about is that if we are to to seek, if our members are, are, are suggesting a, a refusal, it has to be done for, for, for genuine reasons. And the, the whole idea of, of planning, controlling people's behaviour um, gives me some concerns. Um, and if somebody does choose to, to eat, eat unhealthily or um, visit takeaways or eat takeaways seven days a week um that that is a behavioral issue which the planning process in itself can't control um in, in addition to that um there are other mechanisms if people choose to eat unhealthily and order takeaways um traditionally i i if i ordered a takeaway i would go and visit the shop because it was local um, that's no longer necessarily the case and i think that's being confirmed during the COVID pandemic, um, that the people dial up pizzas, the dial up takeaways, um, and you know they do that from the couch, whether whether there's a, there's a hot food takeaway around the corner or there isn't. Um, so to 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 pin all hopes of healthy eating on on the planning process, I, I think is a a bit of a long shot. Uh, I, I do agree with those sentiments, but I, I just think there's so many other mechanisms where people who choose to eat in that way. Um, can exercise w whether there's a one on the corner shop or not. Um, so th that that was that was the, the the background to the particular position. Uh, just to, just to very quickly on on Councillor Newell's point as well. Uh, in my responsibilities for environmental health, that you were asking about um, basins, Councillor Newell. Um, the, that that detail wasn't provided. Um, within the application, so I understand. Um, but there is a statutory requirement under different health and safety regulations. They've got exclusion zones for hot food takeaways around schools, around hours of opening. Uh, also, about um, three out of the seven have uh, policies for promoting um, healthy, healthier hot food takeaways as well. Um, there is a few others, exemption zones, etc. I think the issue also comes about hot food takeaways, about choice. That, the, that there isn't, I can't actually think of in that area where I would go for a, a healthy option if I wished, you know, as a takeaway. And sometimes takeaways do happen to be convenient. Um, I think at the last full council meeting, we had um, representations from Councillor Newell and Crumby about the um, mortality rate in that area as well. And also about joined up writing, just uh, following on from uh, what um, Mr. Coates has said. I mean, I was looking up at the Healthy and New Town stuff that uh, the DBC were doing in 18, 19, and it wasn't just planning, it was incorporating planning, health, education, et cetera, et cetera, it was to work across the board. So it wasn't just sort of up to planning to say, no, you can't have a hot food takeaway. It was supposed to be across the board. Now, I assume that's all finished, the Health and Newtown stuff, I don't know. But I would have thought that legacy would have been sort of embedded into the DBC sort of system of, you know, when, when things like this do come, you know, what what is the impact on 
you know, people, you know, and although, you know, people do have a choice, at the moment, with healthy food, you've got, with, with hot food takeaways, you've either got the choice of, if you want to take away, you take it or leave it, because there isn't that healthy option available. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Heslop. I've got Councillor Kate next. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to follow up because the resident's um, correcting me. Um, and she seems to think that that shop's been closed for closer to 10 years rather than five. I okay. just wanted to make that point on her behalf. But I also wanted to follow up on the obesity piece. Um, Dave Coates has mentioned choice and that people can order from their sofas, which I completely agree with. However, I think we're missing the point when it comes to children. Um, places like larger chains, McDonald's, KFC, Burger King, they've all got policies in place where children can't order from them. You need to be a certain age to be able to get them. One of the things that Lisa said was that there will be a pass and trade element on this shop. Now that pass and trade will be will be children, teenagers. They'll go in and get the chips and the kebab. Um, and my last point on this application is in regards to litter. We can we can say through this process of application that they need to be considerate when it comes to litter. But I've got a takeaway on my ward. Um, it's in front of a massive playing field and I'll, I'll tell you now the amount of litter that we get from the takeaway shop is is, is considerably high because children and um, teenagers that go in and get a late night pizza chips it, it's just thrown on the floor I'm afraid that's thank my you, final points on this one okay. councillor Lister thank you chair um I just wondered if anybody knows what this, what sort of food this shop will be selling, because you know it might be a vegan pasta shop or something. I don't know, but I've, I'm in sympathy with the world councillors, obviously. But I just think there's been a lot of stuff said about takeaways and unhealthy food, and and as somebody, I must admit, who's been eating an awful lot of takeaways since lockdown, um, it's not all unhealthy. And, and without knowing what this shop is going to be selling, it's a bit difficult to make a judgment on that. OK, I, I will bring the agent in or the applicant in when if I'm sure he's listing all these questions that's piling up for him. Councillor Clark. Councillor uh, Clark. Uh, yeah, I'm on mute. Um, I would just like to echo the, the thoughts of Councillor Newell, Wallace and Heslop um, about the takeaway situation, about the po uh, planning policy. It, it it it's quite obvious that um, Darlington is saturated with takeaways at the moment, and like Councillor Wallace, I would not feel comfortable in the future sat having to debate or pass another takeaway in Darlington. So it's clearly about policy, and I think this it's something that we clearly need to look at. Um, the, the, by not opening takeaways, you're not going to. Uh, solve the obesity problem it is down to personal choice um, but it's it's obvious I think most people that the amount of takeaways in Darlington has reached its limit um, so that's basically just all, all I'd like to say on that matter. Thank you Councillor Cousins. Thank you thank you chair <clears throat> my point is going back to the ramp and just if the shop are busy and the busy working in the shop, they don't see the disabled person want to be in, or when they've served all the people and the ramp needs to be removed and they're still quite busy, what will happen there if they forget, you know, th there's that element of maybe forgetting to remove the ramp after each, you know, disabled customer. Um, that's my concern. Yeah, can't, OK, Councillor Cousins. Councillor Allen, are you wanting to come back in again because you have been in once? Um, yeah, just a quickie. Um, everybody talking about obesity and planning policies. I've just looked through the original draft local plan that we were given when we were first elected. There isn't one policy in that um, document that has anything to do with health and with food or with anything that we uh, several councillors are now talking about. So my question would be if somebody could get back to me, um, either Dave Coates or indeed David Hand, because he's 
in charge of planning policy. Do we have anything in the new version of our draft local plan which addresses these kind of issues at all? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. So somebody will, do you want to do that now, Dave? Okay, okay, okay. If, is that yeah. okay, Chair? Yeah. Uh, very briefly, Councillor Allen, you're absolutely correct. Um, there isn't any specific policy um, in the old local plan, the draft local plan, or the one that's now on deposit. Um, the, the, there is reference to going back to what Councillor Hesloff was saying um, about the Healthy New Towns movement, um, which hasn't gone away. Uh, we, we're still taking that into account. Uh, and within the draft local plan, you will find reference to healthy new towns philosophy um, and more particularly um, how we're encouraged from as, as far as the planning system in, operates in Darlington, how we're encouraged to to look carefully at the location of, of hot food takeaways for all the, the reasons we've, we've been discussing. Um, but they are quite specific um, where there are a number of them in a particular area or more particularly if they're adjacent or, or very close by to schools so whilst we don't have a formal policy hook which says one thing or another about about takeaways uh, there is reference to the, the healthy new towns program uh, but it is quite specific in terms of its proximity to to schools and it, it's it's a generally accepted concept just the right thing to do if, if there was a um, the takeaway outside of school. Um, I'm, I'm sure we as, as officers would be recommending to members that it would, should be refused because uh, it does would be flying in the face of what we're hoping to achieve with the, the Healthy New Towns programme. In this particular case, um, I, I, I don't think it fits into that category. I believe there is a, um, a primary school relatively nearby um but the, the, there's no comprehensive school nearby and i, I would suggest that, that they would be the the main visitors of of, a, of, a, of an operation like this thanks Jane. okay thank you very much i did say that i would bring in there's no more members to speak so i would bring in the applicant to simply answer the questions that members have asked that you can clear their minds david marge am is it are you there margeman Yes, I'm here, Chair. It's uh, David Marjoram. Yes, from ELG Planning in Darling. Thank you. Would you like to answer the questions that members have asked on litter, what type of food and so forth, and, and the queries over the, the uh, disabled ramp? Yeah, it, I mean, in respect of litter, obviously, as been pointed out in the uh, committee report, there is a, um, a litter bin available um, outside the unit. And also, um, you know, I would respectfully suggest that you know the, the proposed use is unlikely to generate more litter than say um, an off license or a convenience store or what have you certainly where I live in County Durham you know we find issues with with bottles and cans from the nearby off license which is obviously just as much of a problem um, in terms of the the precise food offer I, I can't provide a, a, a response on that as yet it was floated a while ago um that, that might be looking to be sort of greek food but you know that's not confirmed um and, and so i can't give it a definitive uh, response on that um a litter initiative was mentioned i would be interested to know what the sort of protocols and details of that are because i'll be more than happy to discuss that with my client to see what's what's going on locally and how they can perhaps contribute towards that positively um, in respect of the, the ramp, obviously as part of a planning application, you know, a, 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 an applicant can't be forced to, to make changes and, and remodel the shop, you know, if that's not their original intention and they're just not in a financial position to do that at the moment. Now, if the shop was to become, come back into use as an off license, um, there would actually be no need to provide anything as harsh as that sounds. But our client really does want to try and do something to aid disabled access, which has led to the situation of a, of a temporary ramp. Now, obviously, if things in due course change and they become in a position um, to, to do something more permanent, obviously that would require a, um, 
a further planning application for external alterations, then I'm sure they would look at it. But at this at this point in time, um, they are keen to resolve the. It was a previous objection from the disability um, local disability group, uh, which has led to the to the temporary ramp. Um, and, and you know, as 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 Dave's correctly pointed out, Darlington doesn't have a, a hot food uh, policy at the moment. Certainly, some of the local authorities. Um, that I, I, I deal with. Obviously, we, we work all over the country and whatnot, and um, they have different policies and what have you, but obviously there's, there's nothing there um, okay. at, at this specific moment in moment in time. And obviously, the client's just looking to bring a, a long-term vacant unit back into back into use and, and um, you know, so, so could have a positive impact in that, in that respect, you know, getting, right. rid of a, getting rid of a vacant unit. Thank you very much, Mr. Majam. Um, just asking the planning officer if we can put a time limit on this temporary ramp on the planning conditions. Dave, do you know if we can? Um, it, it, it would be, in theory, possible, Chair, yes. Um, it, if uh, Picking up on, on Council, Councillor Marshall's point in that accepting the fact that disabled access is required, um, the, the argument's been put forward essentially for financial reasons. That's not possible in in every sense of the word at the moment for a, a start-up business. Um, but members may consider um, that, you know, as a temporary measure to get this up and running, um, mm -hmm. it, it, it might be acceptable with a view to um, providing a more permanent structure in the longer term with a with a with a time scale identified. That that's not totally unreasonable but i think we need to satisfy ourselves before we uh, impose such a condition if members are minded to uh, to make sure that was achievable on a permanent basis there'd, there'd be little point in, in imposing a condition which ultimately was impossible to do and somebody could never fulfill so I'd, perhaps the the agent would, would, would comment on that with your permission chair can you comment on that david Bashar? Yeah, I, I would just be interested to know that the precise sort of structure of the condition, what it would be requiring of my, of my client. I mean, I don't know whether, you know, the, the council, you know, uh, are able to formulate a suggestion in that regard um, for for us to consider. Um, it, I mean, is would it be sort of um, the a ramp has to be provided within a, a certain time scale, a more permanent solution? Um, because obviously oh, that yes. obviously that would require um, a further a further planning application for that for those external alterations. Um, certainly, I mean, if it's a, if it's sort of like a longer time scale for that, um, yes, I, I think that that would be something our client would potentially be um, okay with um, if it was if the committee were. Uh, minded to grant permission. Obviously, if it's a, if it's a shorter time scale, it is a little bit more difficult because it, it'll, I suppose, it'll very much depend on the sort of the success of the business. Mm. Thank you very much. I'm going to open it to Lisa now to uh, to sum up, please. Oh, Councillor Johnson, sorry, I didn't see your hand. Thank you, Chair. I was just somewhat bemused about the argument over this ramp. It, it's been put forward to DAD. They're the experts who have said they will accept it. And yet we seem to be uh, in a long debate about whether it's acceptable or not. Uh, and the, the other thing which is concerning me is Darlington's economy needs new businesses opening up. And so we must be careful that we don't throw these opportunities away. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Right, does um, Lisa, do you want to uh, summarise before I open it back to members? Thanks, Chair. Just, just, just very briefly to recap. Um, as we explained, it was an existing um, hot food hot food takeaway. Sorry, I'll start again. An existing off licence. Um, it's proposed, albeit it's been closed for a number of years. Um, proposal to, uh, to 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 uh, change the use of that ground floor to a to a hot food takeaway um, as I've explained a number of controls to be um, in place to be secured by planning condition in terms of hours of operation delivery hours um, controls over the extraction system etc to ensure that um, 
um, impact um, from activity arising from that it, on the amenities of surrounding properties are kept kept to to a minimum. Um, and also, we've discussed about the um, the, the, the portable ramp as well. Um, that, that's, that's a subject of, of conditions nine and ten. So. Um, Thanks, Chair. That's OK, I'm going to open it up back to members now if you want to question the officers at all and anything before we move to a vote. Uh, Councillor Toscavan. Thank you, Chair. Um, whilst I sympathise with the ward councillors, uh, particularly around the health related issues, I can't see any planning reason uh, to refuse this application. So I would move that the officer's recommendation is accepted. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a I'll second? second that? I'll second that. Yeah. Moved and seconded by Councillor Johnson that we accept the recommendations. Does anybody want to move anything different? No. Paul, can I move that to you, please, to uh, sort the vote out on the... You put your hand up again, Councillor Toskin, or, is that, or have you just forgot to take it down? Thank down. you. Over to you, Paul Dalton. Okay. Thank you, Chair. OK, members, so um, the motion that's been put before us is to move the officer recommendation, which is to grant um, planning permission subject to 11 conditions outlined on pages 22 to 24 of the submitted report. As we do usually, I'm going to go through members' names in alphabetical order, and if you can indicate whether you're for or against or indeed abstaining on the motion. Uh, Councillor Allen. For. Councillor Clark. Abstain. Councillor Cousins. Abstain. Councillor Heslop. Against. Councillor Johnson. For. Councillor Mrs. Jones. For. Councillor Keir. For. Councillor Lee. Um, for. Councillor Lister. Abstain. Councillor Marshall. Four. Councillor McCollum. Abstain. Councillor Tate. Four. Councillor Tostevin. Four. And Councillor Wallace. Against. If you bear with me a moment, please, Chair. OK, Chair, that's eight votes for the motion, uh, two votes against and four abstentions. The motion is therefore carried. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Paul. It's carried. Can we now move on to 5B, which is 20 Langholm Crescent College <coughs> Ward. Who's taking this, you, Dave? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chair. Hello, members, again. Um, this is page 27. And it relates to 20 Langholm Crescent. Um, that's the, the general location in, within the West End. It lays in the heart of the West End conservation area also. The next slide, please, Mike. That's the um, bungalow set in a quite a, a large plot. And you'll see from the, the, the general context of the area, um, they are two and three storey, quite sizable um, terraced houses um, around that area. Um, so you can see that the scale and character, or certainly the scale uh, within within that rather large plot. Um, unusually, um, at the top of the site, the north of the site, um, off Swinburne Road, that's the that's the current access into into the area, which is rather unusual, which is something I'll I'll show you in a minute as we as we move through the slides. So the proposal is to, to take some down, take down some fairly um, ugly additions to to a building which does have some character um, and a wraparound extension, which again, I'll come to and show you in a moment. Um, and the insertion of a, a new drive of Langholm Crescent um, between two particular trees. Uh, it does involve the loss of um, one pear tree adjacent to, to the house, um, but not considered to be of particular significance. Interestingly, um, on Langholm Crescent, historically, 
um, there was a, an access through there. So it, it's not actually introducing something which is uh, historically um, has no precedent. That, that there was an access through that point when when this site was it's, it's understood to be a, a former dairy. Um, so that's the, a, a bit of context to the area. Uh, one of the key issues, of course, is that um, when we're looking at this, because on, on face value, this is a, um, a residential dwelling with, with some relatively insignificant extensions to it, uh, in, in my opinion. However, uh, our judgment of this needs to be fairly measured, I think, because it's within the context of the, of the West End conservation area. So the general expectation is um, of, of design is, is higher um, and we need to make a judgment on its impact on, on the conservation area. So the, the, the if next slide please Mike. That's a, a, an aerial shot uh, and you'll, you'll see uh, the number of neighbours consulted which were 41. It's quite extensive. Um, the, there was a uh, a flurry of objections to to the to the scheme initially. Uh, you can see on on screen there was 14 uh, dotted around the site. Um, but in in recent days, uh, a number of those objections have have been um, removed. So you can just bear with me as a quick update, Chair, to, to go through what stuff that isn't in the report. Um, there's there's one letter has come in to to reaffirm the objection. Uh, saying they have fundamental concern in regard to the proposed creation of a boundary opening onto Langholm Crescent. I'll show you a detailed plan in a moment. Um, there's a letter of support that's been received. Um, who considered this person considers that the, the building's configuration is currently out of step with modern living and the proposals actually uh, bring a quite an important local building back to life. And we have four additional letters um, withdrawing previous concerns regarding um, the site, Pe people who have previously objected. Um, and that's essentially around um, the car parking arrangement on Langham and the, um, the the potential access that goes into the site. Um, so there's, there's four, four people have withdrawn objections following further discussions. There's a letter of support. Um, and there's a, a reaffirmed objection from somebody who's previously um, made comment. Next slide, please, Mike. That's the um, block plan of the proposal. You'll note at the uh, centre right of the screen, that's the new access point. Um, thank you. Um, which removes a certain part of the hedge and uh, a timber fence which goes right right round the periphery of the site. Uh, it does avoid the removal of any significant trees. Um, it, it, there's a small shrub to be removed, which again I will show you on a on a on a future slide. Those blue lines indicate uh, the additions. Uh, if I can ask you to, to keep that fixed in your mind when I when I start to show you the photographs, uh, it's a wraparound extension running around the arrow there, all at single storey level, and a new garden room to the right hand side where we're indicating there at the moment. There's also a car parking space um, to the right of, of that uh, to accommodate two car parking spaces. A number of the objections, Chair, uh, have related to um, by punching through um, the, the, that, that, that fence and hedge row, um, by creating an access. It would effectively re remove some car parking from the street, um, which is true. Um, but the, the argument here and the arguments being offered by the the applicant is that there's additional car parking off street, which is provided in a much more suitable location in, in, in the slide that you actually currently see, rather than the very awkward position with, a, with access off the rear lane to the north. The circular line, the dotted line there in the, in the middle of the screen, uh, that shows the uh, potential or the, the, the removal of an existing pear tree. Next slide please Mike. That's the the uh, existing ground floor and the proposed ground floor. 
um, you'll see that there are a number of um, removals from the existing structure. Um, on the left hand side of the screen, there's a, there's a boiler room, which is a pretty incongruous feature. Um, there's a, a plastic um, conservatory to the bottom end of the scheme screen, and um, there's, a, there's a conservatory type porch, for want of a better word, also to be removed, none of which uh, have any intrinsic value or add to the appearance of the building. On the right hand side of, of, the, of the screen, you'll see indicatively um, out width of that blue line that's drawn in the top corner. That's the wraparound extension, all of which are at, it is at ground floor level. And there's also a new garden room, um, essentially on the enlarged footprint of the porch, which is to be removed on the left hand side. Thanks, Chair. That's all. Thanks, Mike. Next slide. That's the existing layout or elevations. Um, and you'll see um, the building is of some merit. Uh, it has been altered quite extensively in various ways, but it does it does actually still retain some character. Next slide, Mike. That's the proposal. Um, you'll see it does remove um, a rather ugly conservatory and, and a porch area and the wraparound extension you'll see on the left hand side starts on the left hand side of the building and goes round the back. Next slide Mike, thanks. This is a view from um, inside the plot itself looking back towards Langholm Crescent where the access is. Um, the, the arrow points to that shrubbery uh, which will be removed so that the access will be slotted in between those two trees uh, with appropriate uh, dig measures ensured to um, make sure that the long-term life of those trees isn't isn't affected that that section of hedgerow um, where the arrow where the arrow is to the left um, will also be removed as a consequence of of that access the rest of the um, hedgerow will be retained next slide mike these are shots, I hope that's clear to everyone, up and down Langholm. Um, you'll see there's a pedestrian access with like a hooped brickwork effect in front of that first white car. Um, the, the, the new access would be approximately where that next white car is, three cars down, which is exactly there. Um, and so it, that's the, the area where the, the timber fence would be removed and as would be the um, hedgerow itself. That's a, a more straight on view of where it would actually go through. Again, uh, missing the two street trees, I mean, important trees within within the street scene. Thanks, Mike. This is um, a plan which was produced uh, at a slightly later date um, when we were originally consulted. And you'll see um, there is a, an existing case scenario at the top um, and then there's a proposed case scenario with the access inserted on the bottom. Um, you'll see there is a, a loss of a car parking space as, it, it's, as that access is, is punched through. Um, but nevertheless, there's, there's two car parking spaces provided um, within the site. The other thing I, I, would, I would point out, Chair, is that the, the rest of the fence, the rest of the hedgerow, hedge which does um, perform an important visual function in the conservation area is retained. The only bit that is removed is that, that part where the, the access is inserted. In terms of continuity of visual appearance, um, there is a, a setback of the gates, which you can probably see at the bottom slide, Mike, just just like slightly up over, up, 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 up there. Uh, it, it's set back uh, within the site, but they are timber gates and they will be constructed um, to replicate or be as close as uh, to the existing hedge, which is an uh, existing fence, which we'll see either side of that scheme. So there will be a setback to enable a, a vehicle to pull on there safely off the highway, um, and those gates will broadly replicate um, the, the timber fencing either side. So in street scene terms, um, there's every effort has been made um, to preserve what I think is an important hedgerow within the context of the, of the conservation area, 
um, and also replicate uh, the fencing that goes around the periphery. Um, the council's conservation officer, we, we've, we've consulted with him um, and is in general agreement with the principle of enlarging the dwelling. Um, one thing I, I'd, I'd like to stress to members, this, this has gone through a, a process of improvement. Um, the, the original scheme had certain elements which um, our conservation area and indeed myself had some concerns about. Uh, in terms of proportionality and, and size of windows and fenestration. Uh, that has been addressed. Um, the, the, the agent has entered into a, a very clear and constructive dialogue with us to make those changes. Um, and we're satisfied now that those, those concerns of the conservation officer has now been overcome. Um, there was an issue remaining uh, regarding um, about the use of materials. Um, but that's covered, you'll see, in condition number two and five uh, in the recommendation, which talks specifically about uh, the finish of the building itself or the extensions. Um, there was some um, concern um, highlighted by our arborist as well um, about the potential for impact on trees. As I previously mentioned in, in the presentation, there is a pear tree to be removed, um, and it, which is perfectly acceptable. It's not a particularly good specimen, but there was concern, particularly where the access runs through, um, that it doesn't affect the long-term life of any other of those trees, um, none of which are TPO, but they are within the, 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 the conservation area. So in, in condition number four within the recommendation, um, you'll see reference to um, how careful the developer has to be when that when that road goes in, uh, and those areas should be hand dug. Next slide, please, Mike. These are the uh, other photographs I, I promised you. Um, these are, are views from the back lane, and rather unusually for, for such a substantial bungalow within this context, um, the, the, the slide at the top left hand part of the screen that's the access into the area of the of the back lane um historical one yes um satisfactory one probably not um and it, is it a more suitable more up-to-date uh, way of actually achieving that off langholm crescent and, and and our view um is, is emphatically yes it is the other view you see at the bottom end um are from within the site the, the, the white door you see just there is, is, the, is the other side of the black door that you see on the top left hand side of the screen. So whilst the access would remain, uh, a much more satisfactory access uh, is achievable from, from Langholm. Um, that's an, an, another shot internally and you'll see um, the porch in rear and the, and, the, and the tree to be removed. That's the pear tree I made reference to. Uh, and the conservatory I made reference to earlier on on the bottom right is a not a particularly attractive feature. It certainly doesn't, I think its removal um, will um, improve the external appearance of the building uh, immeasurably. And you can see that the building generally does have some merit within the terms of the conservation area. The other thing I, I mentioned to you right at the beginning of the presentation is the importance, whilst a lot of these things um, may seem fairly trivial, and in, in terms of uh, there's, there's, there's an element of um, improvement here, which is which, which forms part of our recommendation to you. Uh, there's another level of consideration we need to, to take into account, which is this, its context within the conservation area, um, and whether this um, actually improves it, uh, whether it has a neutral impact um, or at what level does it harm it. Um, the, the, the view of offices is that, um, that that test within the conservation area context is, has been passed. Um, it is arguably uh, has a neutral impact on, on the conservation area because it's not a building which is highly visible in the context of the conservation area because of the high level fence and hedges that go around it. Um, Plus, there are there are fair you know a number of features which are on that 
that screen, which will be removed from that building. Uh, so there is an argument to say that there is a, um, a significant improvement in terms of um, its, its very design and nature within that context. So um, at very worst, uh, the argument from officers to members is that you would have a, a neutral impact on the, on the conservation area and is therefore acceptable. There's um, a few conditions, Chair, I, I beg your pardon, there's another slide. That, that's showing the context generally from Langholm Crescent in the road. Um, you'll see there's a hedgerow behind that, that fence line and the vertical timber fence, which will be replicated by the insertion of the road, um, by the, the gates, which will be set slightly back from there. So there's a degree of visual continuity that, that goes through there. The, the, the recommendation, Chair, is, is, to, is to grant planning permission. And I, I'll draw your attention to um, the conditions which start on page 34 and go on to 30, 33 and go on to 34. Um, condition number two is key because this is a conservation area building uh, in the light of the conservation area, uh, can, conservation officers' comments. Um, there is a requirement to submit details of external materials and finishes. Uh, which, which ties in with the conservation area status. Um, bearing in mind the proximity of the access to um, non-TPO trees, but trees in, 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 in the conservation area. Condition four um, relates to um, the uh, submitted tree survey and agricultural impact uh, and the uh, hand digging requirement. Um, and on condition five, um, there is a uh, fenestration details because there is some relatively minor changes to, to window window detailing, which we want to make sure is right um, b before um, the, the, the development proceeds. And, and that is a requirement um, of condition number five. And the recommendation is to approve. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I forgot the ward councillors. Uh, any comments from the ward councillors? No. Do members wish to ask the applicant, Mr. Steve Hesmanhauer, is here? Does anybody wish to ask a question of him? No, no, no. No, no. Oh, Councillor Lee, you've got your hand up. It was, it was more for, for the officer, uh, Chair David. Two, 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 two simple questions. One is that in the summary of the objections on, on issue four, proposal is not sympathetic or in keeping with the conservation area. Um, was, if, did the person who sent that in, did he expand on that or is it just a simple statement? It'd be interesting to know what, what he's objecting to quite specifically. That's the first thing. And the second one is, uh, can we assume that the new driveway will have porous material to allow the water to go through it? It's not mentioned in the condition, but can we assume that will be the case? Damn. Unmute. Yeah, sorry, Councillor Lee. Um, yeah, the, the second part of, of, of your question, perhaps if I can answer that first, um, in terms of the porous material, yes, that that will be a requirement um, to to ensure that um, adjacent trees aren't affected. In, in terms of the impact on, on the conservation area, um, it, it is a judgment at the end of the day. Uh, it, it's a judgment we have to make. Um, it's a requirement that we make a, a judgment because it's within the context of the conservation area. Um, th there's no th there's no further explanation now from, from the objector other than that it would have a, a negative impact on the conservation area and that, that's a legitimate position to take. Um, but in, in our officer's judgment, um, particularly bearing in mind that the process we've gone through to improve the design uh, in consultation with the, the applicant now conservation area, we have arrived at a position where uh, we consider it to be new, which is which is adequate um, to, to actually be able to recommend an approval. Thanks well, I, I, Thank you very I, much, Dave. I, I, just, I would accept that. I, I, would, I just thought that the, the person who objected would have actually said, given the reasons why he or she felt that it wasn't sympathetic okay. to the conservation area. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lee. Councillor Johnson. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, in informatives on page 34, we, we talked about the section 184 crossover. Now, um, this area is heavily parked 
at all times. Does that mean we have to put yellow lines down or, or something to prevent parking opposite the access? Um, uh, did, uh, perhaps if I could very quickly start off and, and hand over to, to Arthur Housen, Chair. Um, technically speaking, um, the formation of the access here um, wouldn't necessarily require planning permission. Um, it, it just forms part of, of the overall scheme, but, um, but the, the removal of the hedge um, and to drive a vehicle into that part of the site doesn't in itself require permission, but it would require um, um, highways uh, approval under, under under that particular section of, of the Act. Just so there's a, a little bit of context to that, Council Johnson. So I'll hand over to Arthur, if I may. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Um Yeah, with, in terms of uh, imposing council uh, parking restrictions, councillor, it's not something we'd look to do in this instance because the, the road's sufficiently wide for the turning movements of a vehicle in and out of the site. And I think the overhead plan that demonstrated the loss of one car, car parking space on the development side. So if we accept that that space is lost, albeit with the betterment of providing in Curtis parking for number 20, I would say really you're sort of getting a net parking gain um, because I think the, the the rear parking arrangement it's not convenient, therefore it's unlikely to be used. Certainly not be used by visitors uh, to number twenty. So, based on what we're saying, I don't think there's any need to impose parking restrictions, additional parking restrictions on Langholm Crescent. Well, the, the the issue is that there is no parking restrictions really in Langholm Crescent. Therefore, uh, it's used very heavily. And so that access there could be covered by a parked car for 24 hours. It could be, uh, I agree, but it's it's not a normal practice to put double yellow lines across uh, an Incurtis driveway access. Um, you know, it's pretty typical um, of Incurtis Park in that form of access. So if we think of neighbouring streets like Gabby Road, Elton Road, Millbank, Cleveland Avenue, We've not imposed parking restrictions uh, across every sort of vehicle access. It's just not something we'll do normally. There is a there is a lesser uh, approach in that we could put a white line yes. uh, access marking across it. Generally, we don't do that unless there's a specific reason, i.e. you live next to a shop and, you know, you get that kind of high turnover parking where people think it's I'll only be five minutes or I'll, I'll park across this, this access. Um, so it's something we could possibly do but generally we only do it where there's a specific reason or something that generates that kind of parking I, I think that's been done quite a lot all over the town especially around schools where parking is intense uh, and residents have not been able to get their vehicles in and out and so white lining has gone down it's nothing new is it no, it, I mean, the school, again, that's another that's yeah. another good example. That's a classic example. But it, it's something we could look at as part of the, uh, the the 184 agreement when we actually give the technical approval of the, the actual construction of the access. But generally, there the needs to be a reason, as you say, like a school or a shop. OK, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go over to the planning officer now. Would you like to summarise on this, please? Lisa, Dave? <laughs> Th thanks very much, Wake Chair. Up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hadn't fallen asleep. There's um, I just, I, I don't think I need to say very much, Chair, other than I, I think the, the, the issues have been addressed. Um, the, the most important one is the judgment on the impact on the conservation area, which we've um, hopefully explained, in our opinion, is, is, is a neutral one. Um, there is a, a potential for a significant improvement to to the existing bungalow um, because of the the removal of inappropriate more recent additions. So I, I see that as a a huge positive. Um, the access to the the property uh, currently from the rear yard is, is is unacceptable in many ways, not very modern way of addressing it. There is a, a much more appropriate way of, of doing this. Um, it's been recognised that the um, there is a tree to be removed, there's a, a pear tree to be removed, which is not, not a particularly fine example. Um, but there's also um, appropriate control to make sure uh, that the access road as it enters the site um, doesn't have any unnecessary damage um, 
to to adjacent trees. Um, nothing significantly changed um, with regard to um, the external appearance of, of the of the boundary of the area. Um, that I do accept is is quite an important factor within the context of the conservation area. The small change to that uh, would be the insertion of of the road, um, and that has been compensated for by the, uh, some recessed gates, which will form um, the um, visual break, which would be very consistent with the rest of the the the, the, the fences which run round the out, outside of the site. Many thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. I'll invite members in to add any further debate, if you wish, or take it straight to the vote. Does anyone want to move anything? Councillor Lee? Um, um, I, I recommend that we approve the officer's recommendations, Chair. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Seconded. Yeah. Moved and seconded. No further motions to move. Paul, can I move it to you now to take the vote, please? Paul Dalton. Yes, no problem, Chair. Uh, so the motion before us is to grant planning permission subject to the five conditions outlined on pages 33 and 34 of the submitted report. And as previously, I will go through and take the vote. Um, first of all, Councillor Allen. Four. Uh, Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Cousins. Four. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Heslop. Four. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Four. Uh, Councillor Mrs. Doris Jones. Four. Councillor Keir. Four. Uh, Councillor Lee. Four. Uh, Councillor Lister. Four. Uh, Councillor Marshall. Four. Councillor McCollum. Four. Councillor Tate. Four. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Tostevin. Four. And Councillor Wallace. Four. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, that's carried unanimously, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Lovely. Can we now move on to item 5C, which is field at Corpse Haven Round Hill Road, Herworth. And who's going to take that? That's Lisa. Me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So, yeah. Um, Page 39 on the on the report, members, um, field at Copshaven, Round Hill Road, Herwith Moor. So the first slide you can see shows the, um, the the general location of the site. So roughly midway between Herwith Village and the um, junction of Round Hill Road with, with, with Nisham Road before the, uh, the roundabout at the, at the football stadium. If we can move to the next slide, please. So this shows the um, the, the configuration here, uh, um, and I'll talk you through the de the details of that. So um, the application relates to a field to the southeast of the property known as Copshaven. So that's the field outlined in in red, as you can see on the screen with the cursor, um, and that is in the ownership of the applicant who lives at Copshaven. Um, and that property is one of three um, converted barns on the east side of of um, Round Hill Road. Um, so, and they're labelled obviously because to, to give context and, and obviously to, um, um, we, we've had comments and objections from, from the occupants, um, which will be explained as we go through the report. So, um, we have properties Meadowbrook and Waterside to the north, um, alongside Copshaven. They, they are the three um, properties from the converted barns. Um, and then Round Hill Farmhouse, um, a detached building just to the south there. Um, so, as I said, the field's located to the southeast of the property known as Copshaven and is owned by the occupant of, of, of Copshaven. Um, it's enclosed by a mix of post and rail fence on the north and west boundaries um, and by mature hedgerows on the, on, the, on the south and east boundaries. And you'll also see on the on the plan there's Creebeck, which runs um, um, to the, to the, in a north-south direction, generally to the east of the site, and the, 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 the blue marking is, is the flood zone. So part of the site lies within flood zones two and three. Um, and just in respect of that, the, the type of activity proposed here, so it would be the use as a, a dog exercise area, as a, as a sort of a, a recreation type use, is, is considered to be water compatible. So when we're looking at vulnerability of uses, um, this is considered to be um, compatible um, Clearly, if there was a flooding event, then um, that there's no built development as part of this proposal, as we'll explain as we go through. But um, the, the owner um, would need to take action in terms of cancelling appointments, etc., to ensure that nobody's put at risk. But uh, um, and that that is mentioned in the report. But 
seeing as though it's shown on the plan, I thought it was useful to make reference at, at this point. Um, so, as I explained, planning permission is sought for the change of use of that field to a dog exercise area. Um, vehicular access um, is to be provided via the applicant's access off Roundhill Road, um, so to the north of Roundhill Farmhouse and to the south of Waterside. Michael, perhaps if you can just hold the cursor over that to show that um, and just move it towards Roundhill Road so we can see the point of access. Thank you. Yep. So that's that's the applicant's um, vehicular access and that will be used to, to, to serve the um, to serve the proposal. Um, within the Kirtledge, perhaps where the, the blue arrow is to Copshaven, Michael, is, is where parking would take place um, by customers, so customer parking there, and that will be for up to three cars at any one time uh, within the grounds of the applicant's property. Um, slots will be booked online. Um, there'll be no turning up. It would be a, a, a booked um, facility. So um, customers could, could book a slot in advance um, and turn up and, and, and use the area to, to, to exercise their dogs. Um, the report does refer to a maximum of three dog owners at any one time with up to three dogs each. Um, with the option to book a, a, a slot for the sole use of the field and those slots would be an hour each. As you'll see as we go through the report and, and the comments that we've had, the objections that we've had, the applicant has confirmed today that she would be willing to, to consider a reduced number of, of, of customers at any one time. So rather than three, as proposed, she will be would be willing to um, reduce that down to two should members think consider that to be, to be appropriate. So I'd ask members to bear that in mind. Um, She's also confirmed that in terms of the um, the slots, there would be an hour slot, although people would have the opportunity to book a half hour slot. But in doing so, the, the, the second half hour, if you like, of that hour wouldn't be backfilled by another customer. They would just access the field for that half an hour and then leave. So there wouldn't be further customers coming in for the, the second half of that hour slot, if, if that makes sense. Um, so in terms of, um, and sorry, just to, to step back one um, step, um, in terms of the use of the field, if you booked an hour slot, you would be expected to be on the field for 55 minutes, leave the, the field before you, your, the full hour is up to allow you to load your dog into the car and to, and to leave the site before the next customers come in for the next hour slot. And likewise, if it was a 30 minute slot, um, there'd be an expectation of 25 minutes on the field and five minutes to, 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 to pack up again and, and, and to leave before, um, before the next slots. There would be no physical structures or permanent structures on the site. Um, there would be some temporary agility type obstacles provided, um, balls, toys, etc., for dogs. Um, water would be provided, but dog owners would be responsible for, for clearing up after the dogs and disposing of waste in, in bins provided. Um, and the applicant has a management plan um, which she proposes to put in place, which when um, customers book a slot online, they'd be expected to sign up to the, the terms and conditions of the um, of, of, of the, the management plan um, when, when making that booking. So in terms of this this aerial shot, um, so the fields outlined in, in, in red, Creebeck, which sort of follows the tree line down the east side. Um, this is quite important just to show the relationship between the neighbouring properties as well. The land to the north of the site um, is is a sorry no just to the, <laughs> the the field area Michael sorry yep that area there is is owned by um, the the occupants of Meadow Brook so that's not in the ownership of the applicant and likewise the land to the west of the site um, keep going down that that area there is 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 owned by the occupants of of Roundhill Farmhouse that's their um, their, their curtilage their garden and this is perhaps an older shop but there is a, um, there is actually an access running through that, that that part of the site as well so as you'll see there's been objections received um, a three in total um, two from waterside and from 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 meadow brook the slide does indicate there's a letter of support from the occupants of roundhill farmhouse has been further comments received expressing concerns so um, again please bear that in mind members and if we can just move on michael so this is a, a, a sort of an indicative layout plan, sort of showing how 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 um, how the field would be used. So access in from Roundhill Road, um, parking within the um, the applicant's um, curtilage space. It's a ha generally a hard standing area where they can accommodate parking there, and then. Um, once the dogs are unloaded, they will be walked down to an access gate in the in the northwest corner of the field, which is gated. Um, and once through the gate and the gate secured, the dogs will be allowed off the lead to to use the, the field um, for, for, for exercise purposes. 
Is there another? Just move on to the next slide, Michael. We'll just talk through the the, the, the photographs. So these two photographs show the the access point. The bottom right is is a Google Street View image, which shows it in in wider context. So that's the access there into into Cops Haven. Um, the property that's parallel to the road, the single story building, is 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 Waterside. Um, the detached property you can see to the right is Round Hill Farmhouse. And then if I just ask you to look to the top slide on the left hand side, this is a, a closer shot. So the, the, the blank gable on the left hand side is, is Waterside. The more substantial gable um, is, is, um, is, is, is the applicant's property, Cops Haven, and that's, that's their access, their sole, the sole access to that property. And just to the ne next slide, please, Michael. So this is taken from within the, the curtilage. So the top left shows the, the access, which runs past the applicant's own property, Roundhill Farmhouse to the left. And then the very bottom of the shot is, is the gable end of, 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 of Waterside as well. And then the, the bottom right is the applicant's curtilage, uh, where the parking area will be provided. And the access down to the field is, is um, between the vehicle that, that um, which is sort of parked next to the trees um, and, and, and the building at the end. So, so customers would walk down that, um, that, that road, that track with their dogs um, leading to the field. If we just move on, Michael, please. So these are some shots taken um, from within the field. So top left is, is, is taken, I guess, from the sort of northeast corner of the field. Um, so the... Um, the, tip, the post and rail fence, which, which is leaning slightly in the top left hand photograph, that's the boundary between um, the, the, the field, the applications field and um, the, the field which is in the ownership of, of, of the occupants of Meadowbrook. And then the top right slide that's taken in the southwest corner of the field and that boundary is the shared boundary with with round hill farmhouse and the field as well it is proposed to reinforce the, to, to replace or to reinforce those um those fences um to contain dogs as well as to to to, to improve um residential immunity for the for the, the occupants of the adjoining properties and and, and land um, and likewise, the, the shot at the bottom is, is, the, is the route down to the field. Um, if you can recall from the previous slide where we saw um, a lady stood in the, in the vehicle, um, that would be the route down, down to the field um, before dogs could be let off. And again, that that, um, that fence on the right hand side it, um, bounds um, the land owned by Meadowbrook, um, which again would be would be that fence would be would be reinforced. So if we can just have a quick run through. Um, consultation responses um, and we've had some additional comments received as well which I need to run through chair um, sorry if I can just take some time to, to do that so the um, the responses are set out on pages um, 41 to 42 um, so no objection in principle by the council's highway engineer and environmental health officer although subject to a number of conditions which we'll um, I'll talk through at the appropriate time um, we've had a total of three letters of objection um, at the time the report was written um, and they raise such issues as um, concern about the access and highway safety issues. Um, there have been a number of accidents and incidents um, with vehicles on Round Hill Road. They're concerned about the narrow width of the driveway and the electric gates um, and concerned that it, it could result in, in vehicles waiting or backing up on the public highway to get in. Um, impact on residential amenity. Um, Pets escaping from nearby properties have been killed on Round Hill Road. Lack of security and fear of crime. Um, there are other facilities nearby and this one isn't needed. Impact on wildlife. How waste will be stored and disposed of. Inadequate boundary treatment and that the field is prone to flooding and poor drainage. And then an additional letter um, which raises issues about... Um, the, the, the suitability of the fence between the two properties, so that's between the field and, and, and Round Hill Farmhouse, and that needs to be altered to ensure the containment of dogs. Um, led to believe all activity will be at the bottom of the site away from the property, but that's not clear. And a gate at the lower end of the field, which is ours and cannot be used for access, essentially that's a, that's a civil matter as well. Um, We've had some further comments um, in, in, in the past day or two, which I'll just take some time to summarise, Chair, and just sort of really raise those points that haven't previously been addressed um, or considered in the, in, the, in the report. I think we've had four in total, so just bear with me. So we've had one um, one comment which refers to the fact that the planning recommendation has been prepared on the basis of a maximum of 
three cars per hour and not 12 cars per hour that could be used by implementing half hour slots and if you can recall at the beginning of the presentation I can clarify that the the owner has suggested she would be willing to um, reduce the number of customers to two per hour and that um, half hour slots are just um, half hour out of an hour they're not backfilled by a second customer in this in the second half hour um, the recommendation suggests the need for three parking spaces for clients and two for residents um, where in reality six client spaces and two resident spaces are needed. Um, the recommendation suggests permission is personal to the applicant managing the site, but it's understood that the applicant has put professional obligations elsewhere and won't always be resident on, available on site. Um, the report has not considered serious accident reports on Round Hill Road and confirms that existing sight lines are below accepted guidelines. Um, the noise management plan is unworkable and could potentially result in a greater number of dogs um, causing noise, which, which will be a major loss of amenity. Um, and consider the application should be refused as it's contrary to CS2. Um, Another comment, which I'm just going to run through with raising similar comments here. Um, another, co another further comment, make it, uh, raising concerns about privacy as their property joins directly to the field in question with just a low level fence. And they're concerned about serious loss of privacy views into their garden, guard, garage, vehicle, house, etc., and be able to see children in the garden. Um, concerned about dogs using the field may gain access to their property and that visitors may be able to view, um, view the field and garden. Um, noise from dogs. Um, the number of vehicles attending the property may cause access problems and cars parking outside of the property may obstruct views. Um, and also the, 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 the compatibility of the site when the, uh, of the use where there are sheep in adjacent fields and, and some dogs may not be used to, to, to being close to livestock. One, just, just one more chair to, uh, to, to, to run through. Um, again, raising concerns about um, privacy and, and overlooking of property from, from, from the, the applicant's drive and from the use of the field. Um, fear of strangers and dogs accessing our properties is a grave concern and high risk of dogs escaping leads when being loaded and, lo loaded and unloaded into vehicles. Um, concerns about um, additional people coming onto the site when um, people are shielding or, or taking precautions during the pandemic, um, the potential for unvaccinated dogs to spread disease, um, which can be passed on to neighbouring dogs, um, and again concerns over highway safety um, and the fact that um, the applicant is employed elsewhere and may not be responsible day to day for the running of the, of, of the, of the project um, and, and not subject to the, to the noise from the, from the use herself. So they're the additional comments, Chair, that we've had, that we've uh, received since the uh, the report was was prepared, um, and I'll just run through the uh, the main issues, if if, if I may. Um, so in terms of principle of development, um, it's a small, it's a, um, a, a a use, I guess, that requires an isolated countryside location. Um, many of the reasons that people use these facilities is that dogs, perhaps. Um, aren't used to sort of socialising with the dogs and perhaps need a, an area of land that's sort of um, remote from other dogs um, to, 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 to use this land and also to, um, you know, a safe environment where dogs can be let off the lead and, and, and without risk of escaping. Um, local plan policy E2 and the MPPF are supportive of small scale developments for, for sort of recreational activities such as this. So there's, there's no policy issue with this. The main issues, however, really relate to, 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 to residential immunity. Um, and I made reference at the beginning to the close relationship of the, of the site, um, the access, um, the parking area and the field to those existing properties within the complex and, and, and the detached property at Round Hill Farmhouse as well. Um, and, and, and the likely impacts that are, uh, may arise from the, from the use of the field and the access as, as a result. Um, as we saw from the slide, the access will pass close to the boundaries with Waterside and Round Hill Farmhouse. Um, the applicant has stressed that she would be willing if members consider this to be appropriate to reduce the number of um, customers per hour to two, um, each with three dogs. Um, so due to that sort of low number of visitors and vehicles, um, 
arriving and, and, and leaving the site against the background noise of existing traffic on, on Round Hill Road, it's not considered to have such an unacceptable impact on, on residential amenity in terms of the, you know, noise and coming and goings, comings and goings of additional vehicles. The parking is within the applicant's curtilage close to the field away from properties, although it is accepted that the, um, the, the boundary treatment, the fencing does need to be improved um, to, 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 to limit views over into the, the neighbouring properties and also to contain dogs. And that's um, subject of a, of a condition within the recommendation, which we'll, we'll look at at the appropriate point. Um, and, and likewise, the boundary treatment within the field um, bordering uh, Roundhill Farmhouse and also the field that's owned by um, Meadowbrook needs to be reinforced too. Um, again, to contain the dogs and to safeguard the amenities of these properties. Um, the applicant submitted a noise management plan and a business plan which, which details how the business is to be run and how she proposes to deal with noise from barking dogs. Um, users of the field will be um, will have to abide by those terms and conditions set out. Um, so, for example, it includes measures where um, owners of dogs that bark excessively um, will need to book the sole use session um, rather than being in amongst other dogs. And also dog problem dogs, dogs that uh, continue to bark will be asked to leave the facility and, and presumably not, not to return. So these measures have been set been considered by the environmental health officer um, and they consider that, the, um, that those measures are reasonable to deal with the potential noise associated with barking dogs. Although it's not considered feasible to, to, to restrict that manage or to seek to control that management plan by condition because it's not feasible for um, for offices to, to, to monitor um, the terms and conditions of, of, of that management plan. Rather, a number of conditions are suggested which um, should the, those all be in place, we'll, we'll seek to reduce um, disturbance to, to, a, to a minimal minimum. So those would be limiting hours between limiting use of the field rather to the hours of eight o'clock and six p.m. So there'll be no activity during the the evening hours when people are expecting a, a quieter environment, particularly in summer. In the winter, clearly there'll be there'll be shorter days because it won't be possible to use the field for that length of time. Um, the condition at the moment refers to no more than three appointments at any one time, each with three dogs per appointment. But as I mentioned, the applicant has suggested she would be willing to reduce that down to two. Um, and members may consider uh, wish to consider amending the condition if they think that's an appropriate um, measure. No kenneling of dogs overnight so there'll be no dogs left um, on the field to bark um, and also making the permission permanent to the applicant. Um, the, 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 the management day-to-day -day management of the field is and, and how the applicant proposes to, to operate that um, it's accepted that if, if somebody else took over use of the field that that, that may change. So it, there's con it's, it's considered appropriate and, and reasonable to, to limit that to the, or make that any permission permanent to the applicant. So it wouldn't pass to anybody else who um, may can take control of the field. Um, so in it, so those conditions, in addition to measures to um, in, improve the, the, the boundary treatment, um, on balance, it's considered that the the use, um, the access, the parking will not unacceptably impact upon um, the day-to-day -day amenities of, of, of those surrounding properties. Visually, there'll be very little change, um, no permanent structures proposed. Um, the next issue relates to highway safety. Um, we've, we've seen the access, um, which is the applicant's sole access, um, and that, that will be used um, and while the highway engineer accepts that visibility displays are less than would normally be required for new access, in this case, the le level of use proposed is considered to represent a fairly minor intensification of that access. Um, so th those those displays are considered acceptable. And in addition, the conditions of the road are such that it's not likely that vehicles would be travelling at, at the full 60 mile an hour speed, um, which... Um, can result in in, in those visibility. You know, is, is, is a is a reason why we can accept a reduced visibility in, in that instance. Um, so for those reasons, and due to the low level of vehicular activity, there's no reason to conclude that the access is unsafe or unable to support the the minor intensification of use. Um, the report does set out there have been no recorded accidents within the vicinity of the site in the past five years, although objectors have referred to various incidents um, 
close by, um, they either fall out, out with that five year period or else are sufficiently far away from the, the application site not to be attributable to, to, to that particular access. Um, so as I said, in bear, bearing in mind the, the minor intensification of the access and taking into account the accident history of the site, it's considered appropriate in, in, in highway safety terms. I've talked about flooding and drainage, the fact that it's in flood zone three and the measure two and three and the measures the applicant would need to take. Um, Another issue raised was the impact on wildlife. Um, but again, the, there's no physical development of the site. Um, the, the field could legitimately be used for the keeping of livestock, for, for, for cattle, sheep, et cetera, and, and wildlife would, um, um, there'd be little impact on, 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 on wildlife as a result of that. In addition, there's, there's limits to, in terms of the scale of the use, the number of visitors there, um, and also the hours of use. Um, in terms of safety and security, fear of crime, um, this is acknowledged, although this would be a managed facility with customers booking in advance and paying to access the field. Um, it is proposed to reinforce those boundaries um, and the applicant has a clear management policy which sets out the procedure for dealing with issues and complaints. So there's no issue to suggest that safety or security would necessarily be an issue, although the concerns of, of, of the neighbours are, are acknowledged here. Um, in the additional comments that I read out, there was mention of, of COVID um, and, and obviously um, concerns about people adhering to guidelines. Um, obviously, any visitors to the site would be required to, to comply with whatever national or local guidelines are in place at the time. Um, I just wanted to, to clarify that. So, um, in just to conclude, it's an open countryside location which is needed or required for this particular use. The concerns regarding the impact on residential amenity are acknowledged. But in view of the low level of activity um, and a range of conditions are pr um, are proposed, which are set out in, in conditions three to eight of the recommendation, which seek to limit impact on residential amenity in terms of hours of opening, personal permission, and the need or a requirement for additional fencing, um, on balance, it's considered to, um, to be accepted on this instance. Um, and we've talked about access and, and parking arrangements and, and, and no highway objection there. So. The recommendation, Chair, is to grant permission subject to those conditions set out on, on page 49 and 50 of the report um, with, with reference to those conditions that I've, I've, I've just mentioned. So condition three would be personal to the, to the applicant and her family. Um, hours of operation between the hours, the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Sunday. Condition five currently refers to no more than three appointments at any one time and no more than three dogs per client. But I've mentioned that the applicant is willing to reduce that to two clients per hour if or two, two appointments at any one time, should members consider that to be appropriate. No kenneling of dogs. The condition removing permitted development rights for any structures that could be placed on the site. And condition eight um, is requiring details of boundary treatment and surface treatment for, for customer car, for, for customer parking. So it's the reinforcement of those boundaries, those those shared boundaries with with Round Hill Road and um, and, and Meadowbrook. Thanks, Chair. You're on mute, Councillor Mrs. Jones. Sorry, Paul. Councillor Toscafin, Ward Councillor. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think this is a very interesting application and um, in the current climate where people are looking for areas to exercise their dogs safely, um, I think it will become extremely popular. Um, I do think, though, we do need to pay careful attention to uh, some of the objections that have been made, particularly in relation to the numbers coming to the site in terms of the access. And whilst um, you're saying that the access is OK, it is a single driveway access and people are quite right. If you did have 12 people coming in and out within an hour, I think that would be too many because you can't get down that driveway without going through electric gates. You've actually got to um, buzz to get through the electric gates. You wouldn't be able to leave them open because then the dogs would run down the driveway onto the road. So there is the potential for queuing traffic to get into the site um, with, with that number of cars per hour. And obviously the applicant has indicated that they're willing to reduce the numbers. And I think that that needs to be given uh, due consideration by the committee and discussed. 
Um, and in terms of the fencing and the separation along the common boundaries, again, the applicant has, a, has agreed to improve that. And um, it's good to see that that will be part of the condition if um, members are minded to approve. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just going to say that um, this is the kind of facility that I actually would pay to take my guide dog puppies to um, for their initial training and initial um, because there is nowhere locally where I live, which I would consider safe. Having said that, um, looking at the map and everything else, the only people really that are affected here are the immediate neighbours. And if all their concerns were addressed to their satisfaction, then I couldn't see a problem because it would mean that all four neighbours have agreed to something. Um, if this is going to come down purely to planning and what we are and aren't allowed to um, exercise our votes on, has anybody thought perhaps, as it only affects these people concerned, of um, possibly a trial period to see how it works and how effective it is and if it doesn't work to the satisfaction of all the neighbours, then they they just can't go ahead and have full permission. Is that something that can be thought of? Is it something that's within our remit? I'm asking that because I don't know. Councillor Jones, you're on mute. Yes, I appreciate that. I'm going to bring in Councillor Heslop and then I will bring in Lisa to answer the questions that you've asked, Councillor Allen. Councillor Heslop. Yeah, I have a comment about two years ago to uh, DBC because I had a representation from several members in the ward, you know, to say, has DBC got any fields for this use um, for dogs that um, aren't able to socialise or need to be let off safely so they can have a good run for exercise, etc. And um, and I was speaking to some people yesterday about, you know, this issue. And this would be a very popular sort of thing. You know, there's a lot of dog owners would really sort of value this sort of um, resource within the area. I can't remember when I looked it up two years ago. I think the nearest place was somewhere near Stockton or something. You know, so something in near it would be a valued resource that's there was just a comment i wanted to make chair okay thank you councillor heslop councillor lee yeah uh, thanks very much chair i think the issue really uh, boils down to the border treatment the boundary treatment because it's very very sensitive on the one hand we can understand that the neighbors needing some privacy um, but at the same time, I'm quite convinced that, you know, if you put the fencing up too high, they'll feel very enclosed, particularly when you look at the, the landscape around there. So I would ask our planning officers to involve the, the neighbours so they can get a nice mutual uh, satisfied solution to the boundary. And I think a lot of the problems will go away. Uh, as far as the number of people uh, visiting three per hour, I'm going to be nitpicking and, and recommend that we go for two, for basically for two reasons really. One is to tick our climate change box. I know we're only talking about three vehicles an hour, but two is a third less as far as carbon issues are concerned. But probably the, the other issue is that the five minute changeover seems to me very, 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 very tight. And I can well imagine that uh, it'll go beyond that. So you could get a situation where people coming in on the hour for their uh, booking only to find that the, the, there are three or four cars within the parking area and they can't park. There's no place for them to park, so they'll, they'll park on the main road. So by reducing it to two, when it does tick the climate change box, albeit a very small one, I accept that. But secondly, and probably perhaps more important in this, in this issue, it does give that additional facility to park uh, the car off the road should um, the change over times um, go longer than five minutes, which I have a feeling they would do. But having said that, if I may, Chair, I would recommend the officers, officers um, uh, 
recommendation uh, based on, on, on two customers per session. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Do I have a seconder for that, please? No I seconders? Second that. Yeah, OK. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded. Does anybody want to move anything different? No. Oh, Councillor Tate, I see you've put your hand up. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd just like to move the officer's recommendation as it is. OK, do I have a seconder for that? Seconded. Who seconded that? Is that Councillor Heslop? Wallace. Wallace, Wallace, OK. Um, right. Paul, can you take the amendments and the the motion, please? Paul, certainly, Paul Chair. Yep, no problem. Um, so the first thing on the table, we have an amendment, which actually is moving of officer recommendation uh, as stipulated within the report. That's being moved by Councillor Tate and seconded by Councillor Wallace. I'll start to go through and take the vote. Uh, Councillor Allen, abstain. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Cousins. Four. Councillor Heslop. Against. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Four. Uh, Councillor Mrs. Doris Jones. Four. Councillor Kia. Four. Councillor Lee. Against. Uh, Councillor Lister. Four. Councillor Marshall. Four. Councillor McCollum. Four. Uh, Councillor Tate. Four. Councillor Tostevin. You there? Sorry, Councillor Tostevin. Against. Against. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Wallace. Four. Okay, members, just bear with me a moment, please. Okay, Chair, so that's 10 for the amendment, three against the amendment, and one abstention. The amendment is therefore carried. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you. If there are no more motions, would you like me to take a vote on the substantive motion, Chair? Yes, please. OK, so the substantive motion before members then is the officer recommendation. Um, as Sorry, can I, just, can I just make a comment? Um, I, was, I thought we were voting on the officer's recommendation to start with. So. Councillor Tate, yes. What was moved initially was the um, officer's recommendations, however, with an amendment to uh, condition number five to reduce that to two appointments at any one time. And that was moved by Councillor Lee and yeah. seconded by Councillor Heslop. What yeah. you moved was an amendment um, which was seconded by Councillor Wallace. The amendment oh, has been fine. carried, but now we do need it becomes a substantive motion and therefore we need to take a vote on it as the substantive motion. No problem. Is that OK, Councillor? That's fine. Yeah. So what we are voting on again essentially is is the officer recommendation as outlined within the report, which is now the substantive motion. So again, I'll just quickly take a vote on that. Uh, Councillor Allen. Abstain. Uh, Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Cousins. Four. Councillor Heslop. Four. Councillor Johnson. Sorry, Councillor Johnson. Four. Sorry, I'm Thanks. struggling with it. Yeah. Four. Uh, Councillor Mrs. Jones. Four. Councillor Kia. Four. Councillor Lee. Four. Councillor Lister. Four. Councillor Marshall. Four. Councillor McCollum. Four. Councillor Tate. Four. Councillor Tostevin. Four. And Councillor Wallace. Four. Thank you. So, Chair, that's 13 votes for the motion, one abstention. The motion is therefore carried. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Can we move on to the next item, please, which is Field School Acliff Lane School Acliff. I was going to take that one. Dave, would you like to share that one?
Thanks very much, Chair. Um, page 53, um, Hainton and Coniscliffe um, Parish Ward. Um, this relates to a, a modification of a, of a Section 106 uh, agreement, Chair. Um, you, you'll see that the red line boundary showing. Sorry, it's, it's, sorry to interject. I'm going to have to leave the meeting for five minutes. Okay. Do, do, do we want to pause, Chair, or? Uh, well, do you want us to pause, or it's I have to just carry to you, on? Chair. No, I think we should carry on. You can come back in later. Yeah. Dave, carry on, please. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, this relates to a, a modification of a, a 106 agreement, which members will be aware is, is a legal agreement associated with the granting of planning permission. Um, it can be used for all sorts of reasons. It can be to secure affordable homes. Um, it can be to secure certain financial contributions, which a, a planning permission can't. Um, so this, in this particular case, um, it, it related to the securing of affordable homes on the site. Um, and the planning permission and indeed the 106 agreement uh, secured 20 homes on this site, um, some of which were for um, affordable rent um, and, and some are shared ownership. Um, and hopefully you can see on, on the screen there, we, we've highlighted with the various dots uh, the affordable rented are in, in green. Uh, the affordable shared, um, which is part ownership, uh, are in yellow. And the proposal here in the 106 is to shift some of the affordable rented houses, which are in, in green, um, to, um, to uh, shared rented, which is shown in um, with the blue dot. So it's five properties within that overall 20 um, are shifting from one type of affordable rent to another from uh, shared um, ownership to rented. Uh, there have been a, a number of objections to that and you'll see where in fact four people have, have written in to, to object to, to that proposal and you see those identified um, on the, the, the red upside down triangles and you, you'll note um, they aren't adjacent to the buildings um, that we were, we were talking about. What, what, what I would stress members is that um, what, what's been secured uh, as part of the 106 agreement um, associated with this application um, doesn't change. Um, all of these categories are still within the affordable um, housing remit which which members quite rightly secured in that that 106 uh, it's just that that shift of tenure uh, rather than a an ownership a part ownership reduced ownership uh, it's moving to a, a rented basis um, this is actually being done through um, a housing association um, members may well have have, have have heard with them heard of them in the past it's the the living group um, they advertise their properties through the Compass system, which is something which is generally acknowledged and used throughout the Tees Valley, including Darlington Borough Council, um, where uh, properties are, are advertised, um, put on the market, for want of a better phrase, uh, and, and people um, can enter a bidding process to, to get them. Um, and, and that's usually often based on, on, on a point system which relates to, to housing need. Now, one of the key things I, I want to stress, nothing changes here. All of those different elements or tenures um, do fit into the, the recognised uh, affordable housing category. Um, this is just a shift in tenure. One of the issues is it's, it's sort of um, engaged um, some people who live on the estate and you'll see from you'll see from the people um, Who've, who've made comment to a residents on the estate say, well, they, they didn't buy into this when they bought their their house. Um, they thought they thought it was shared ownership throughout. Well, that, that's not quite the case anyway. But um, the this is an increase in 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 rented property. Now, 
the key element here is is whether the developer is actually meeting the requirements of the affordable housing package which is a requirement in the 106 um, and the answer to that is emphatically yes yes they are um, the the, cha the the changing slightly um, the, the tenure that we're actually they're actually looking at for us to consider um, one of the key points here that I, I would seek to stress to members is that um, we, we're not making any um, judgment here or shouldn't be making any judgment here on on somebody's tenure uh, and whether they are fortunate enough to afford a mortgage or a reduced mortgage or indeed whether life suits them to to rent um, I, I think that is a um, that is a, a moral judgment if you like and certainly not a, a planning judgment within the context of this 106 um, we, we have received some additional comments chair um, which I, I I did ponder over whether I should be um, reading them out but in terms of completion completeness um, I will um, th th there is a, a, a an email that's come in to say four police vehicles attended uh, number five elderberry close which is an affordable rented property um, owned by living properties I've previously mentioned uh, and the renter was arrested um, this person's concerns regarding living changing the tenure of a further five properties from shared ownership to affordable rentals is confirmed in their opinion um, and that should be avoided on what is considered to be a, a family estate um, the, the reason I mentioned that is to perhaps reinforce my original comment about um, meeting the requirements of affordable properties which we have an obligation to make provision for and developers have a, have a, have a requirement to meet. Um, I'm, I'm really keen, my advice to members is, is very clear that we, we, we can't and shouldn't make any form of moral judgment about how or any link to somebody living in a rent, rented property may have um, a, a lesser opinion of how they look after it or how they live their lives or anything like that. That may or may not be the case, but it, it's not our place in, in, in planning committee to to make those judgments. So I, I was just very keen to, to, to make that clear with members. Uh, the, the key point is, um, incidentally, I, I, I'll, I'll add to that, we have had a a rebuttal from the living group which again I, I will share with you in terms of balance um the, the first part of it says we cannot go into confidential details this is a living group the owners um we can confirm that the incident on the 6th of february on elderberry elderberry close as reported the planning officer uh, did not involve antisocial behavior or criminality of any kind um, indeed living has received no reports of antisocial behavior to date um, our first tenants moved on the, the Oakland's estate over two years ago. Um, and it goes on to say, uh, living manages over 8,000 affordable rental homes, uh, the vast majority within Durham County. Um, they, they are advertised through the Compass system, as I uh, indicated at the, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, and, and Darlington Borough Council uh, participate in that particular system, as are a number of authorities do without the Tees Valley, throughout the Tees Valley. So the, the, the key issue I want to concentrate on is that th this is a, a requirement of the 106 to provide affordable homes, both this level of tenure, whether it's shared ownership or, or rental, fit into that category um, so that there's no significant change in that respect. But it's, it is a technicality because it moves a shift away from shared ownership towards rented, but they do fit that category. So I'd ask members to, to be very uh, mindful of, of, of how they, they consider that position. From, from, a, from a planning perspective, um, th there is an argument to say that when we provide affordable homes, um, shared ownership um, doesn't tick all of the boxes because shared ownership clearly does allow people to um, enable people to get a mortgage to, to buy a property which is more affordable to them. Um, there are a group of society either through choice or um, 
or, or income can't afford to get or don't want to get on the mortgage ladder. And it's important that our affordable provision has that range of options for people. Um, and this rented increase on this particularly on this particular state um, broadens that choice, in my opinion, um, and something that could be um, or should be welcomed in, 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 in making housing provision for, for those that can't get on the, the property ladder. Um, the recommendation, Chair, is um, to, uh, to allow the change to the 106 because it does still meet the requirements of affordable homes um, as, as identified by national government. It's simply a change of tenure um, and it does allow, this change would allow a broader offer um, to the to the um, affordable homes portfolio, um, not only on this estate, but within the borough. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Before I open it up to questions, I feel I should point out, because you don't have about the social, there's no social stigma to, to living in a rented house. Um, you could buy a fully house where all the streets privately purchased and there's nothing to stop the next door neighbour because he's moving abroad putting his property up for rent you know it happens police visit private houses as well as they do rented houses so I want to put that to rest first there is no difference as far as the people live we are all sociably uh, respectable people um, I've got two hands Councillor Johnson I think you put your hand up first followed by Councillor Lister Councillor Johnson Yeah, thank, thank, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I find this a, a very interesting application. Um, it, it seems as though, as planners, we've been asked to uh, bail out a developer who can't sell the properties that he built. And um, I don't like that. The letters of objection are not unreasonable, and the committee of the day approved the layout uh, in its original form. Uh, so I, I'm, I don't understand why we've been asked as planners to assist a developer who is not selling the houses he built simply because of the circumstances we're in, I guess. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. If, if, if I may come back, Chair, yeah, just to address your question, Councillor Johnson. Um, Nothing changes here at all. Uh, the layout remains exactly the same. It, it, that is identical. Um, the look of the properties remain identical. The, the, there's no change there whatsoever. Um, the, the only change um, is in the tenure. And the, the, the reason there is a, a change in the tenure because the offer of, of affordable purchase um, hasn't been taken up. Um, the, the people who um, can afford a mortgage, um, albeit at a reduced level, haven't come forward. So this is an alternative way of providing um, affordable homes by a different tenure. Um, and it just so happens to be to be rented. And, and what I was offering in, in my presentation, Councillor Johnson, was that um, this is a, an opportunity to broaden that offer. Uh, it's not just affordable homes shouldn't just be about somebody who can't quite get a mortgage. Um, it, it's it's people who um, either through choice or simply can't afford for whatever reason to get on the mortgage ladder um, to, to provide a roof over their head. And I, 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 I didn't see any particular issue with that from a planning perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Just to come back quickly, uh, I, I, I'm not debating the need for a uh, rented property. This is not a question about rented property. This is a question about bailing out a developer who has not done what he said he was going to do, and that was to sell these homes in a particular way. Thank okay. you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lister, you're next. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm actually outraged by the comments about rented properties and um, I don't understand why people think that people who live in rented properties aren't as good as people who are trying to buy them. I would—I don't know this area very well, but it looks like it's in a village. 
and I thought that properties for young people to stay in villages and in the country and in these sorts of places should be available. Um, I don't agree with Councillor Johnson at all. We're not bailing anybody out. We're bailing out people who need houses, if we're bailing anybody out. And um, I actually feel like moving the officers' recommendations. I just think it's dreadful, some of the comments that have been made about their neighbours, and particularly some of the red triangles, are very near to other rented properties. Um, affordable rented, what's the difference? Um, I just, as I say, I'm outraged by some of the comments that have been made today. I, I can understand your comments, Councillor Lister, which is why I made the point the people that live in the homes are no different whether they own the roof over the head or whether they're rented and that's my opinion i think about the people inside thank you councillor allen thank you chair um mr coates page 57 paragraph 20 um i'm a little bit unclear um regarding i sort of had this feeling that section 106s were obligations which meant they were more or less set in stone uh, but then it goes on to say units to be secured in perpetuity as the clauses expressly allow them to be changed if agreed to by the council is that the way i'm reading that is we can put a section 106 on and a developer can come along and change that um as long as the way they phrase it means that um your department is unable to refuse them um so i'm a little bit unclear as to a section 106 and secured in perpetuity being contraindicated on this particular paragraph yeah thank, thanks councillor alan um the um in, in this particular case it, it wasn't secured in perpetuity and uh, there is a, a justifiable reason for doing that because um circumstances change um you know the, the the market changes as has happened in in this particular case and it does allow us the opportunity indeed it allows a developer to come forward and ask the question because of change in circumstances it doesn't mean to say we have to agree it um it, it, that, you know that 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 control is is firmly <clears throat> excuse me is is with us um and if there wasn't a a formal a formally justified case which i believe that there has been made here uh, we don't have to agree it at all but i i genuinely believe in this particular case if members were minded to, to amend the 106 um it's actually doing the right thing um it's actually exp expanding the uh, tenure offer across that site um and it's not just restricting it to people who can afford to get a mortgage uh, it, it's 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 actually opening this up um, to people who can't get on that ladder. And I, I think I know we don't make moral judgments here, but um, I, I think it's the right thing to do. Um, thank you. If I may just come back quickly on the same thing. Uh, my fear is that the um, the affordable shared and the affordable rented, if they're not set down as in perpetuity could they disappear completely at the whim of the developer uh, to, to answer that question councillor allen no good absolutely not they, they would have to fit within that category of affordable homes in in you know whether it was rented tenure or whether it was some other, other form um they couldn't just say i tell you what we're not going to provide affordable homes anymore you don't mind do you the answer to that would be no you can't do that so further down the line, those 10 affordable rented cannot be taken away. That that, that stands. That is absolutely in perpetuity. correct. That they would have to fill in or uh, fit into that um, affordable category. Yes. Thank you. Thank that you, was what I was concerned about. Councillor Lee. Councillor Lee. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Um, just to respond initially to Councillor Lister. I think you doing the people are rather injustice, Councillor Lister. She's, they are not suggesting in any way that everybody who shares a rent are rogues, vagabonds and criminals. What they are doing and what they're experiencing is probably, sorry, what, what they're reflecting on is an experience which they've had and which I think as councillors we have also, whereby 
people who do rent, no, sorry, some people who do rent don't look after the properties as those who are actually putting their hard-earned cash into them. Now, what we should also remember is that, and, and I'm saying this off the top of my head, somebody could correct me, but I should well imagine that the majority of the people living on that new, new estate are from Newton Aircliff, are from Darlington, are from Bishop Auckland. They themselves have rented property. That's the way we are. Though. You get married, you settle down, or you earn a bob or two, but until you can do that, you're living in, you're living in rented property. The idea didn't. I'm sure everybody else has done it. So to, gen so, so to take that attitude, uh, council listed that they're having a go to everybody who rents houses, I think is grossly unfair and wrong. Point to the, there, there is, there is a reality. I was that, not saying that oh, at oh, all. Oh, sorry, if you want yeah, to uh, speak, put your hand up, Councillor Lister, and I will bring you in. I, but I'm not going to let this no, turn into a, a banter, I didn't, please. I didn't want to speak. I just wanted to do it on a point of order of personal explanation that right. I'm being misunderstood. Right. Well, if I if I may just go on from that. Um, these uh, The majority of these people are paying an awful lot of money for these beautiful houses on the Auckland estate. And they are lovely houses, a lovely estate per se. A lot of them will be spending the majority of their hard-earned income on that. So there they are very, very conscious of people, of some people who may rent houses and not look after them. And in so doing, of course, bring problems to the doorstep and at the same time devalue the properties. Now, I for one, can hold my hand up and stare anybody in the face to say I've actually experienced this as a councillor, not personally, but the estate next door to it, we had a family going living in there four or five years ago. I, I don't think we can do that, councillor. Well, I'm just Lee, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. That person could well be recognised and we are in the no, public they domain. They well, I would rather you didn't do that as an example. Use somebody else's uh, situation. Well, th Can let you me stick just... to the points of the planning application, well, they, they, please? Well, I, what I'm going to do is I'm just trying to justify the comments which these people have made that I have actually experienced as a councillor situation where people have had to leave the home uh, because of the, the neighbours who have been renting very, very nice five-bedroom houses. So I can understand and appreciate um, some of these comments have been made. Um, like Councillor Johnson, I, I have great difficulty accepting uh, a change in status on these things. Uh, housing estates, which are currently under construction at Highington, have not had similar problems. So I'd ask Livin as to why, why they are having these particular problems when the other estates haven't had any. Um, so in conclusion, yes, I can understand it. B, I have... Um, great difficulty accepting any change. Uh, these agreements were made, we've agreed to them, and then a few years down the line they come and ask to change them to, to satisfy their own, for their own requirement. Um, but yeah, uh, so I, I can say no more than that. I know it's a very difficult one to, to, to make judgment on, but from my own experience yes. I can totally understand where these people come from and I should imagine if any of, if councillors are sitting there, I'm quite convinced, uh, if they look within themselves, they would only agree also where some of these comments are coming from. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Right, can, do, do you want to sum up on this, Dave, and then we'll uh, move it to the vote. Um, th thanks very much, Chair. Uh, just very, very briefly, um, it, it, it is a requirement of the 106 to provide affordable homes. Um, there's 20 of them as part of the original 106. Um, this is seeking to, to amend that slightly um, by introducing five uh, rented homes instead of five affordable or shared ownership homes. Um, all of those categories fit within um, the affordable homes category. Uh, so th there's no change there in, in any respect. Uh, none of the, the location of those properties change. Um, they don't look any different. The, the layout remains exactly the same. It's the form of, of tenure we're talking about. Um, and, and, and my offer to members is that um, this improve this this actually improves the, the the affordable housing offer on 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 the estate because it does take into account um, people who, for whatever reason, can't afford or choose not to get on. Um, the mortgage ladder uh, and there are people in those categories 
Um, and that, that shouldn't really be um, formed part of any part of the judgment that we take. Um, the, the important judgment that we need to take, in my view, is um, the, the 20 houses still fit into that affordable category. And the, that, that's the key judgment I, I'd ask members to consider. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair. Is anybody going to move anything now on this? Uh, count oh, sorry, Councillor McCollum. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, can I move the, rec the recommendation put forward by officers? Thank you. Do I have a seconder for that? Seconded. Seconded. Right. Oh, there was a hand up from Councillor Cousins, but I think you've changed your mind, haven't you? Yep. No, Councillor Cousins, I've just seen your hand up after Councillor McCorn started talking. Have you anything further to add? Are you second in this? I was just going to second it, but everybody else did. He has. So, All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paul, do you want to take this vote, please? It's been moved and seconded to opposite the recommendations of the officers. And I don't think anybody's moving anything against it, is there? Is there a motion against that? No? No, no amendments? Thank you, Paul. I think it looks like we'll just take the, the vote, please. Oh, Councillor Tate has raised his hand. Councillor Mrs Jones. Yeah, sorry, it's just a process question. I missed the presentation, so I'm not going to be part of the vote on this one. Thank no, you. No, that's quite right, Councillor Tate. Thank you. OK, Paul. OK, if there's nothing further, uh, Councillor McCollum has moved the officer recommendation within the report, and I heard Councillor Lister seconding that, first that's of all. Right. Um, if I can just take the vote then for or against Councillor Allen. <coughs> Abstain. Uh, Councillor Clark. For. Councillor Cousins. Four. Councillor Heslop. Four. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Against. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mrs. Doris Jones. Four. Councillor Keir. Four. Uh, Councillor Lee. Against. Councillor Lister. Four. Councillor Marshall. Four. Uh, Councillor McCollum. Four. And Councillor Tate, you're not going to register a vote. That's correct, is it? Mm. Uh, Councillor Tostevin. Four. And Councillor Wallace. Four. Thank you. OK, Chair, that's ten for the recommendation, sorry, for the motion, two against and one abstention. The motion is therefore carried. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Is there a substantive motion? There isn't. Is there a yes? No? No, Chair, that was the only thing that was moved. That was no, a substantive we've voted else. on. Yeah. Thank you. Just, just check it. Right. Thank you very much. That's the end of the applications. Um, and there are no supplementary items on this. Are there any part one questions, please? No. Thank you. Part yes, two. There is, a, there is a part one question, Chair. Oh, sorry. Councillor Wallace and Councillor Lister. OK. Councillor uh, Wallace. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, if I can ask a question of uh, Mr Coates. Uh, Mr Coates, um, a little while ago I put a question in regarding the uh, so a TPO application for a series of black poplars uh, trees in Skirningham uh, adjacent, were planted uh, adjacent to the grave of David Green. Um, I know this, I didn't make the application, uh, but I was made aware of it. Um, I wonder if you can give us an update on progress with the application because it seems to have been somewhat problematic. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, Dave, you're on mute. Sorry, Councillor Wallace. Um, the, um, yes, I am aware of, of the inquiry. I, I, I am aware of, of your follow up as well. So apologies for not coming back to you quicker. Um, the, we're currently looking at it. Um, th there is an argument, notwithstanding the fact that that, that gentleman is buried there, which isn't a, a reason why you'd put a TP on it. It's the quality and visual appearance of the trees. Um, and we are currently looking at that. And I, I will undertake to come back to you um, by the beginning of next week. If I, um, if, I, if I could just follow up, Chair, it's helpful to hear that from uh, 
from Mr. Coates. The fact that they're black poplars as well, is that going to be, is that material? Because yes, they, they are now very unusual trees in the countryside. We're very yeah. proud of the black poplars in Darlington that yeah. we do have. And I, and I do hope that uh, we can make some positive progress on it. Thank yeah, I, I, that, that, no, not at all, Councillor Owen, so I'll undertake to come back to you. Okay, thank you, Councilor Chair. Councillor Lister, I think you have a question. Thank you. I don't want to take up much time, and it's, it's the only place I could raise it. Um, some of the presentations with writing next to them, um, I can't see. They're so tiny. And I just wondered if you know the, the screen could be expanded, because they're in the middle of the screen, and I just can't read some of it. I've got new glasses, but I still can't read them. Um, th th thanks, Councillor Lister. I'll... Um, We'll do all we can. I, I, I do appreciate um, when we're under normal session, uh, these things appear on a big screen um, and they're, they're much easier to see for all concerned. And, but I, I, I will look at that again to see if we can bump those, that, that, that annotation up to, to help everyone. Thank you. Councillor Thank, thank you. Councillor oh, Thank you, Chair. I'm not sure if this is the appropriate place to raise it, but I was just wondering, because this issue will come again to planning committees about hot food takeaways, etc. Is there a mechanism where we as a planning committee or DBC itself can look at hot food takeaways and also the impact on the wider community in in terms of health, obesity, et cetera, et cetera, um, so that we do have a structure when, because this will happen again, so we've got a structure in place to base our um, deliberations, I guess, on. Thank you very much. Uh, to, through you, Chair. Um, yeah, Councillor Heslop, as, as we've described, we, we don't currently, nor do we anticipate, have, have having a, a formal policy framework to, to make that judgment. But as, as, as we quite rightly discussed before we made the decision, whilst we don't have a policy framework, uh, we do have the, the, the new towns um, policy, sorry, healthy new towns uh, framework, which does talk specifically about health in general, um, but more particularly about considerations of, of hot food takeaways, particularly in close proximity to schools. So that, that, that is a, a policy hook that we can guide members down. And if we are seeking to um, regulate or modify where, where hot food takeaways actually appear, uh, we do have a control uh, as far as they relate to proximity to schools. Thank you. No further questions, Councillor Tate. And Alan. Yeah, yeah, sorry, it was just for a little bit more clarity on that last one from Councillor Heslop. And um, I think as members, we're all aware now that we've got that hook, but it's very specific to schools. I think yeah. what members are looking for is maybe an extension to the policy. Um, how would we go about that? Maybe which cabinet member does it sit with? Because um, I think we need to do a bit more in regards to health and obesity, because doing that application we've just done, I didn't feel like we are doing justice for the people of Darlington, really, especially when I hear that other councils in the area might have a better policy. We need a better policy. Thank you. Just just in response through you, Chair, um, Councillor Tate, um, we, we've of course got the, the local plan on deposit, um, which is going before an inspector shortly. Um, and I, I guess if members felt that there was um, having approved it at, at full council, if, if members felt they wanted to, to add something in, uh, there would be an opportunity there to make those representations to the inspector, um, to say that notwithstanding the approval of the document, um, in the light of current experience or recent experience, there may be an opportunity to, to introduce something. And the, and, the, and, the, and the inspector may take the view that, that that's correct, Councillor Day. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Um, Mr Coates has just sort of answered what I was going to ask. I was going to ask, are we too late to actually formulate some wording uh, and draw up a policy that we can include um, in our draft local plan um, for the inspector to see before he gives his yay or nay? Uh, Councillor, as I say, the, 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 the plan is, is with the inspector now. Um, is, is currently going through it. 
Um, so in, in terms of are you too late? Yes, you're too late to have it form part of the, the plan he's looking at. Um, but it's not too late to make representations to him if you felt strongly about that particular issue. Thank you. Yes, I personally would. Is there any chance that we could um, ask all uh, councillors, maybe put it out to all councillors, how they would feel about the inclusion of something? Um, perhaps the appropriate department could uh, develop some wording that we could perhaps all agree on. It, it would it would it would have to be done fairly quickly, Councillor Allen, because obviously the uh, the the hearings in public are, are coming up. But um, it is at a very early stage, um, and if something was put to them by by members of the council or even a number of members of the council, he couldn't not take that into account to make a take a view on it. Okay. Uh... I've got Councillor Keir next. Do you want to come in and then because uh, Andy Harrington wants to come in and I do feel he'll give us a legal point on it, but I'll bring uh, Councillor Keir in first and then Andy can answer us all and then I think we've had enough questions. Councillor uh, Keir? Uh, I think everybody's kind of in agreement that we need to look at a policy. I don't know mm. if necessarily going through the, the local plan process is the way to go. I think we can agree that subsequent to the local plan either falling or, or being passed. I think that would be something as a group. It'd give us time to do it. It'd give us time to make sure it's the right policy for Darlington. Um, mm -hmm. And it also would um, you know, it'd give us a, it'd save us having to go through another body as well. You know, I think it's, uh, I think it's done to us. Uh, so personally, I, would, I, I, I wouldn't think we'd have to go through the local plan process to do that. I, I, if I may come back. On, on, on that, there's, um, I, I, I agree. I think having come to this point, adding additional confusion after the much delayed local plan mightn't be the best way forward. But um, the, the, an, another option to, to, to consider would be um, some sort of special local agreed policy, which does carry material weight. Um, and that could be formulated, that could be adopted by cabinet, it could be adopted by full council as, as the right thing to do. Um, which would carry material weight. Um, what, what I'd have significant concerns about is having some sort of blanket policy where we're against hot food takeaways, because I think that is challengeable. Um, it would have to be a criteria-based policy where it may formalise where we're considering applications in close proximity to schools, where we're considering applications with a high obesity level or ill health level, um, so that, that there would it would have to be criteria based so that needs some thought uh, to enable us to, to give it maximum weight a, a blanket policy across the borough i think would be less than successful but it, it, it could it, it could be given weight through agree, agreement at full council through a um i, I think that would be the pref that, that'd be my preferred route um to be honest with you, uh, Mr. Coates, and, and as much as it keeps it in our control, um, we're not we're not holding other things up and doing other things. It's a it's a policy that we in Darlington are going to, I mean, like other councils are doing, um, and it, it I think it I think it does need a real good look at um, rather than being a rushed sort of thing. So I think I think doing that would be the better yeah. would be the better course of action in my view. Mm. Uh, Andrew Errington has had his hand up for some time. You obviously have a, a ruling on this, Andrew. Keep us right, please. No, it was, it was just to suggest that, uh, as has been mentioned earlier, I think David Hand's probably away from this meeting the best person to speak to if you want to put mm. forward some policy. Well, I think also, we'll I was let, going to mention sorry. that um, last year, Public Health England produced um, a 40 odd page document a lot of information as to how to uh, produce a policy uh, for in relation to healthy waste environments etc so it's well worth if members are wanting to sort of move in that direction it's a very useful document which sets out the type of things that uh, that should be looked at okay i'm sure that andy Kerr will take that up I'm, i've got echoes i do apologize i'm sure andy will be looking at that with you uh, andrew so We'll leave it to members to look David. at it. <laughs> David. Andy. Andy um, who? Andrew Errington I'm talking to, am I right? 
I can see his name's written there, but I called him Andy, and I do apologise for that, Andy. And, and David Hand. <laughs> David who? David Hand. Who oh, gosh, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm looking for his name here. Yeah, no, no. well, I'm sure... <laughs> I'm sure that uh, Councillor Kerr will get you all together, along with Dave Courts as well, and put something through Cabinet or to Cabinet or to full Council for all members to have to debate that properly. So can we leave that at that one? Councillor McComb, and then I'll... Councillor, Councillor McComb, are you happy with that? You put your hand uh, back down. Yeah, yes, Councillor, I just wish not to prolong the meeting any further because we have been going some time, but just to yeah. concur with Councillors uh, Kerr and... I'm several sure, others yeah. and with Andrew Arrington about the merits of a, a supplementary planning document on this issue there are several councils mm -hmm. in the northeast region that do have similar documents and I, I have had sight of the the uh, healthy weight environment planning documents from PHE so I would be very much in favour of uh, a discussion on that matter down the line thank you lovely and Councillor Kerr you're next I'm sorry if I've added some to your workload but <laughs> it's a hot takeaway <laughs> uh, 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 it's a it's a legacy hand. That it? Thank you. Yeah, it's a legacy hand, and it took us. Ah, step. right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Part two. There are notifications of appeal, and I don't think anybody wants to comment on that, do you? No. I recommend we mm. receive the report, and we move to part three. I'm sorry. I'm, I can hear myself through me comp. My echo is terrible. Mm. Um, pursuant to section 100B5.